We begin with a leader's look conversation focusing on developments in the geospatial ecosystem and today's conference theme of digital transformations. The leader's look conversation will be moderated by Dr. Nadine Alame. Dr. Alame is the inaugural executive director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute. She is a world-renowned geospatial expert. And as I heard her speak upstairs this morning, she is truly a champion of collaboration, innovation, diversity, and knowledge sharing in the geospatial ecosystem. Before joining the Taylor Geospatial Institute, Dr. Al Alame was the CEO and president of the Open Geospatial Consortium. She is also an appointed member of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. Please welcome Dr. Nadine Alame. Yes, good morning, St. Louis. Now you can hear me. How's the energy in the room? Yeah. Yes. And hopefully the energy online as well. Um, I think this energy to me is the energy of geospatial finding a home right here in St. Louis. And we live in some amazing days of geospatial. We're in the middle of digital twins. We're in the middle of computer vision. We're in the middle of 3D. We are at the forefront of disaster response. We're at the forefront of climate intelligence. We're at the forefront of national security. Everything is geospatial. And I think this is the energy that we're going to create today and we're going to sustain throughout our careers. Um, I am the new executive director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute, and we have this vision to create the world's leading geospatial research collaborative. I don't know how many of you know about the Taylor Geospatial Institute, but we're actually a consortium of eight amazing organizations. So if I call your name, you gotta say woo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. Uh, so if we have anybody here from Washington University, St. Louis, <laughs> oh, they're shy. <laughs> Anybody from UMSL, University of Missouri? Yay. <laughs> How about Harris Stowe University? Yes. <laughs> uh, Missouri SNT? Yay. <laughs> uh, Chicago, Illinois. Urbana Champaign? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I love it. How about the, the Danforth? Uh, plant Center. I saw you. I saw you. Yes. How about St. Louis University? <laughs> this is the energy of geospatial. So all the woohoos you've heard from, they're the future of geospatial. And I'm very honored to talk about the future of geospatial with some amazing leaders in geospatial. Uh, but before we do that, uh, Jack was telling me that the best way we can kick off this event is exactly how he kicks off his annual ESRI conference, which hosts usually 17,000 people, and they all do this, which is stand up and just say hi to the person next to you, who they are, meet somebody new. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> what uh, Jack didn't tell me is once this happens, how do you stop people talking to each other? This is amazing. So I hope this energy stays with you throughout the day. And speaking of meeting new people, let me introduce our three panelists. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> this I'm very happy you're here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yes, um, let me introduce our three leaders. Um, they represent industry, academia, and government all on the same stage for the very first time. So I want to introduce Mr. Jack Dangerman, the founder and president of Esri. I would like to introduce Dr. Fred Pastello, uh, the president of St. Louis University, and our host today. So thank you for hosting. And last but not least, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, Vice Admiral Whitworth. Very, very nice to have you here. Industry, academia, and government coming together around geospatial here, which is amazing. So I have a few questions for you. Um, starting with, uh, probably I'll start with you, Director. Um, I'm very curious. We all know about the NGA. We're the reason we're here. And NGA is co-organizing this event. But I wonder if you can, if there's something you wish to share about NGA that people sort of don't know about the NGA. So what more would you like to share? It's a great question, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. So if there's one thing that I wish people knew about NGA, it's that there is an agency that is not like every other intelligence agency. It happens to also be a combat support agency, which from a national security perspective is a very important distinction. We can talk about that later. That also is a place that can help save things and run to causes, like calling balls and strikes just the truths as we know them relative to the thickness of the ice at the poles, the changing of water, the encroachment of water, and just to say things that we know to be true based on our visual observations and the context of our experience. And we've got people consequently at this agency who might be high school interns who are passionate about what they do. And then we've got people who have been serving at this agency for over four decades and they're just as passionate and energetic. That's a unique place. We concentrate on national security. We concentrate on being prepared for pacing challenges like China. But at the same time, if called upon, it's absolutely proper and expected for us to help with humanitarian crises. Uh, and we can talk about Maui wildfires, where we've actually had people on scene helping search and rescue. Hurricanes where we had people on scene helping search and rescue. Even places like Morocco that didn't even know that they needed the assistance and we were providing some geospatial assistance to them. What a privilege for the people of NGA. And I do hope that more people across the nation realize that if you're looking for a place where you have that variety of mission and fulfillment, you can find it at NGA. Thank you, and thank you for all you do. I look at, uh, yes. <laughs> I look at uh, Dr. Pastillo, you know, listening to you, and I know, you know, you're new to geospatial. So what have you learned about geospatial and what fascinates you? Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, let me uh, welcome you again. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you here, Dr. Alme, thank as the inaugural director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute. Mm -hmm. The intelligence, the ambition, the drive, your expertise is going to take us far. So we're thrilled at this fifth Geo Resolution Conference to have you uh, here with us leading this afternoon. Welcome. And welcome to St. Louis University and the city of St. Louis from those of you beyond that. Uh, I am the one up here who is not steeped in uh, geospatial uh, science and not living it uh, day to day, but it very quickly became apparent to me uh, when I arrived here in St. Louis in 2014 how important geospatial science is to this region, to the world, to this university, and to the consortium of research institutes uh, and universities that we've pulled together, and as represented in this room and as you called out. Um, the problems that we're facing as humankind right now needs advances in geospatial research to be able to address them 
in the manner that they must be addressed. And we've already touched upon and will continue to touch upon just what's taking place in our planet. We can talk about all the problems humankind has faced, is facing, and will face. But if this planet can't sustain life, can't provide clean water and food for its people, there is nothing else that's going to matter. And geoscience, geospatial research, uh, geography plays such a critical role in everything from precision agriculture, which uh, we are engaged in here in St. Louis with the Danforth Plant Science Center, collaborating with others in the application of uh, geospatial research to providing the food that humankind's going to need now. So uh, it's readily apparent to me as a relative layman in this area how important this science is and its advance for humankind and its survival and thriving. This is so, so good to hear. And now I see Jack shaking his head because I love that you're sitting next to each other because Jack has a whole career in geospatial. I mean, you started ESRI 50 plus years ago. So from your perspective then, what has changed since when you started to today, where we're at today? Are you looking at me as an old man? Is that it? No. Really, I, <laughs> Not sure. What Not a sure. way to start the morning. I mean, <laughs> but it's true. No, I, I really, uh, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to pause a minute and think about when you first encountered this field. Can you remember the moment? Did you know right away that it was interesting? Some of you did, some of you didn't. It just showed up on your screen, this is a job, I've got to do it. But for me, I was really lucky in, uh, in university. Those of you who are students here, uh, I really encourage you to look at this. But for me, it was in a class in November in Boston. It was like the lights went on, oh my God. And this was like 56 years ago. Uh, and I just was enthralled by it. At that time, we were working with mainframe computers, we had homemade software. Uh, we had to automate our own data. It was a mess in a way. But still, the vision of how you apply geographic science to actual applications so that the, the, the work that people did would be enriched by geographic knowledge, that thrilled me. So um, what hasn't changed is that thrill. What has changed is we went from mainframes to minis to workstations to PCs to web. Uh, we've gone from data that we had to digitize ourselves to dial tone data coming in in real time from satellites from that to uh, human experiences that are uh, virtual real time. It's like, ooh, it's like watching television, a complete digital earth or digital twin of the planet with all of its data and processes are being modeled. That's, that's transformational, actually. And it's not just the technology, it's not just the science with it, but it's also the applications have expanded to, to, um, you know, to co-evolve with these innovations. And those applications now reach about half of the people on the planet, like the COVID map, 1.3 trillion times it was viewed, and it changed people's view of what was happening with this disease. I mean, people saw the whole bloody disease differently as a result of it. And uh, so I, I think this is, at the same time, my belief system is it's just beginning. We're seeing the emergence of a digital twin of the planet with many different organizations contributing to the digital twin, and then using that digital twin with advanced tools like AI and machine learning to give humans guidance. I mean, there's still trouble, and we can talk about that in a few minutes, of how you apply that in a polarized political environment. But wow, uh, you asked me for what an old man says about <laughs> the evolution of this. It's like from a stupid kid getting excited to watching this evolution, it's, it's thrilling, actually. And yet it's still early days in building this nervous system of the planet. You know what I'm talking about, nervous systems, because you all have them. Sure. You know, you, you see things, you cognate, and then you respond. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
Don't you do that every day? Yeah. So imagine that the world actually has a nervous system so that collectively we can actually be guided based on the changes that are occurring. And uh, being able to bring that together and teach that and support that and incubate new companies that will build on the nervous system, that will create a sustainable future, that will consider all the factors that would consider geography, yep. <laughs> the science yep. of the world, science. in digital terms. This is, this is what is about to, to happen, huge transformation. And there's many players in it, many opportunities to get some of that stuff. Yep. So. Your energy is contagious. I was watching your faces, and then I was looking and watching you know, the audience faces. And you definitely see the sparkle in the eyes, especially when you ask them the question, how did you first encounter it? Um, so the theme of the conference is digital transformation, the world of data from sea to space. So I'm wondering if we can share, especially you know, with this audience and the rising leaders of the future, some of the initiatives that you're doing within you know, your agency, your university, your company, and your ecosystem that's actually sort of making a difference. Maybe we can start with you, Director? That's a great question. I'd be remiss not to move towards something called Maven, which is an AI ML program uh, that used to be a project. And this moves to the version of NGA that I alluded to before as a combat support agency. So we are immersed in combatant commands probably an average of about 100 people or so per combatant command. And these are the commanders who have really important responsibilities for indications and warning, as well as preparedness and targeting. And the scale of that is daunting. But so is the necessity to be correct. In the course of this 34-year career, the hardest thing, I believe, in adhering to the laws of armed conflict, which broadly equate to humanity, necessity, proportionality, and distinction. We all, by our values as Americans, tend to know humanity, and we tend to know necessity, and we tend to know proportionality. Distinction's hard. The guarantee that we're correct, that we are distinguishing combatant from non-combatant, enemy from non-enemy. That, as I review, in my mind, mentally, all of the calls that we've made as an intelligence community, and especially in combat preparedness and combat execution, that's the only thing that really got me nervous. I knew we were going to be correct otherwise in execution, but I wanted to ensure that we had it right in terms of the distinction, the positive identification of what was on the ground. Enter now the scale a deluge of data that helps inform this positive identification challenge. So a lot of discussion is happening in Washington and other places about guardrails, ensuring that we have guardrails for the use of AI and ML. And we're really invested in this. And it occurred to me recently that Maven, as a place where we are employing the best of breed People at NGA who understand what they're looking at and have years and years of experience in making positive identification calls. A place that I consider the vanguard of distinction. Now training a machine to do the same. Mm -hmm. Structured observations that are indexable and ultimately relatable to the machine for learning. That then becomes artificial intelligence. So as we worry about emplacing guardrails on AI and ML, it occurs to me that our version of AI and ML in Maven itself can be a guardrail, because we are human. And these are very hard calls sometimes when you're talking about distinction. And so if you're interested in saving people and ensuring that you're always correct in these very important decisions by these combatant commanders, the Secretary of Defense, and the President. I think you like the backup of having a machine that has been trained by the best. 
That's why it was a really important decision by the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security to move MAVEN over to NGA. We're using the best to train these machines to ensure that we're always correct and that we're complete. I hope that helps. It helps a lot. A machine trained by the best. Mm -hmm. That should be a tagline for anybody asking about uh, the repercussions of AI on the workforce and all of that. That's amazing. Uh, maybe I can ask you, Jack, uh, to chime in, since I know you're involved in, like you said, so many domains. So any initiative that comes to mind that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, just listening to you, Admiral, the idea of training the AI tools with humans. This is a new kind of engineering. It's probably the most highly paid engineers today in the world, is people who train the AI technology, which has got to be guided by human experience, experience to experience. And uh, yes, building, the, the, in my world, building the tools to support you and organizations like you at different, you know, civilian, is my main job. That's, I like to say the words, I like to build great tools that help our users do their work better. It sort of just drives me. And at the same time, I want to democratize these tools. So the, uh, we have major programs in education to give our software away to tens of thousands of K through 12 schools. I like to grow the intelligence. Uh, we have 7,000 NGOs in conservation and humanitarian work that we give the software away to and train people to do conservation uh, and address that big challenge. Uh, and working on tools has been my life because I can actually see that there's this relationship between advances in the technology and advances in the method. In science, you would relate to this, uh, the idea that for every advance in technology, there's an advance in method which creates new understanding. And that, that to me is what gets me excited <laughs> is if we can invent things which affect methods like the great making the world smarter now, the nervous system for both national security and environmental security, uh, that, that really gets me excited, but it's not enough. It's also you know, using like the university to get it out to kids, uh, young people uh, and kids, so that they actually grow up to have geographic intelligence or geospatial thinking or approach problem solving and approach the way they think using the geographic approach. Right. This excites me. Yeah. So AI and then the tools. And I know, Dr. Pessoa, you're passionate about the impact yeah. and the quality of life of people in the future. Do you want to comment on this yeah. as well? So, you know, within the academy and using St. Louis University as an example, about eight years ago, we realized how powerful this was, how important it is. So um, in the academy, what do we do? We, we generate knowledge through the research of faculty, often in partnership with students. We transmit that knowledge to students and we form the leaders and employees and um, people uh, who are going to innovate in the future. Uh, we started moving to make bets in this area uh, eight years ago. We started funneling more university resources to support this sort of research, the faculty, develop new programs, train students. And then we realized after a few years, this is so big that to continue to do it in isolation alone, we would only go so far. There was a ceiling. And that's when we started to think bigger. How do we tie in a number of research organizations working with, instead of dozens of faculty, thousands of faculty? Instead of working with thousands of students, tens of thousands of students. And so we started to create this vision, uh, sponsored very generously by the Taylor family, but approached other organizations in the region, and they readily saw the vision, contributed to building a broader vision, came together to form this institute so that we can advance science, prepare leaders in this field at a rate that would have been impossible as a single organization. So much as AI is tying things together, we in the academy are coming together around advancing this knowledge at an accelerating rate. That's very inspiring. So let me ask you to dig deeper. 
So I'll start with you, Fred. What keeps you up at night then? <laughs> well, you, you always want more resources, right, uh, to put toward this, because the things with which we are dealing are so serious. Um, you know, on the defense side, I'm sure you would love to have more resources. As I said initially, we're a Catholic Jesuit university here. Uh, we come out of uh, the Society of Jesus and their values and their mission uh, to help humankind, to help humankind thrive, to walking with the most disadvantaged. And when we look at the world's social problems, being able to address them, to have the tools to address them, to minimize uh, suffering and mi misery, and to prepare a world in which everybody can thrive, and it starts with the most basic things, food, water, security, shelter. Um, those are the things that I worry about, and what we're talking about here is fundamental to helping us address those problems. Mm -hmm. Jack, what keeps you up at night? Well, seeing our users work tells me that our future is at a difficult stage. How so? Doesn't it make you guys nervous looking out five years, 20 years, 50 years? I mean, I've seen the maps from NOAA and elsewhere about climate change, uh, lowering of biodiversity, those things that we really depend upon. And I suspect mine is exactly like everybody in this room. It's, it's scary. And, uh, but I also notice that through the history of humans, especially in the last few hundred years, humans have tended to be successful. In some ways, that has spawned population growth and, and uh, you know, we've got hospital systems, we've got education systems, we have institutions, we have uh, U.S. economies that were unheard of 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and this has, I just say, made us more successful. But unfortunately, the opposite uh, sort of invisible thing that's happening is our very success is impacting so much of our possible future. It's not sustainable living the way we do now. And so what makes me nervous is we have the science, we have the technology, but we're not seeing this massive movement in leadership to take the understanding that we're now having and direct it to, uh, you know, massive direction. Like like what happened with uh, Roosevelt when the Axis powers were, were attacking us. I mean, President Roosevelt got Henry Ford, uh, not Henry Ford, but Ford Motor to start mobilizing and took their whole company and made trucks and Jeeps and tanks. And Kaiser, he got directed to, okay, build a steel. And, and the whole bloody country was in on it. And he got every individual, he got every company, he got these major forces going. And yet we don't see, at this particular point, that same kind of mobilization. Uh, with world leaders, we're still in this country as evidenced in what's going on this week. The right, the left, they can't, you know, they're, they're polarized. So in the, in the situation where we, we have a questionable future that we actually have the science to show we're still struggling, yeah. and okay. Yeah. I'm all in, I'm wanting to do everything I possibly can, as I'm sure everybody here in the room is, but yet we're unable to do that, that big event, you know, the bringing together of all of us to realize, because we do understand it, don't we? I mean, it's right in our face, yet to the Admiral's point, uh, you know, the, the information is still being argued about. We, we, we do have the science, and it's credible science, uh, you know, how, how we make that happen. Okay, with COVID, we saw, as I mentioned, the COVID maps changed the world view. We saw it as a contagion for what it was. So the very technologies that we're dealing with have the hope and the promise, I think, to wake everybody up and bring consensus and bring collaboration and move. But that's what keeps me up awake, yeah. awake at no, night. I'm, I'm sure the Admiral has exactly the same uh, notions and ambitions. I could say ditto to so many things that have already been said. I could also say the pacing challenge of China. I could say ensuring that Ukrainians are empowered with geospatial 
support that allows them to defend their own country. But I tend to gravitate to my training, and I am General Mattis trained, as, as well as General Austin, Secretary Austin, General Milley, et cetera. But General Mattis always used to say, uh, enemies don't keep me awake at night. I try to keep them awake. Mm -hmm. ah. I like. Good. So I, it's a truthful statement. I don't typically have adversaries or enemies keep me awake. Uh, I, could, I could probably say the chance of missing something in our review, an anomaly that should have been seen or a behavior that should have been identified. But I'm confident in our people and I'm confident in our processes and with enabling technologies like we just talked about with Maven, I'm really confident in our future. So I would have to honestly tell you the thing that typically keeps me awake is, is human capital. It's our people, our talent. And this is exactly what I told our people in our first town hall with all of our employees of NGA. If someone were to tell me that they don't find fulfillment or impact, I will toss and turn on that all night. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that doesn't happen very often. But I also will toss and turn if we're not generating enough for the future. So if you look at our numbers of geodesists and people who understand geomatics and people who understand the science uh, and understand the relevance and have that passion, if we don't generate those numbers, then everything we're talking about could be in jeopardy. Yeah. So human capital, human. that absolutely is something worth staying awake at night about. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. So we have less than three minutes, so I wonder if we can talk a little bit about the future, and not the future five or 10 years from now, 50 years from now, right? Because this is building the, the future ecosystem. So quickly, maybe we start with you, Admiral. What will the future look like? What will we be celebrating and at geo-resolution 50 years from now? If anyone's nervous, uh, I would just say remember our principles and stay principled. And if we do that, if we remember our principles and our values as Americans, then I like what the future of human machine teaming looks like. I like what the future of transparency looks like. And that you've got an agency and you've got a team frankly, that's dedicated to calling balls and strikes, just calling it like we see it, and keeping very, very truthful. Uh, so I, to me, the future is bright. All right. Human machines, transparency. Fred? Yeah, I, I agree entirely. I'm um, very optimistic because science is self-correcting and helps improve the human condition. And as Jack was talking before, I thought about when did you first encounter technology. I remember first getting a Garmin, you know, so what happened to the Rand McNally Atlas? What happened to those paper maps? You know, and just a simple garment, how that changed how we traverse through, uh, with automobiles through traffic. And now how sophisticated our cars are with, you can find a gas station easily. You can get your route determined based on what traffic conditions are moment by moment. How much better decision we can make in just traversing things uh, on the road. I can't begin to imagine, Nadine, what. 50 years is going to be uh, like. It's, I think science is going to help solve these problems and take us to a future that makes us as individual humans much more successful in achieving our ends. All right. Again, human machine, human. How about you, Jack? Well, 50 in 50 years, I hope we're celebrating that we were able to create a sustainable and safer planet. But that just isn't going to be technology alone. It's not just going to be science alone either. Uh, it's going to actually be up to individuals who have the intention and the thought that they can actually do something. And so actually to everybody in this room, I'll simply say that you and the work that you do and actually how you do the work will be very important. I mean, you actually understand geospatial in ways that no one else does. That, that's really interesting to me. So let me repeat it. You and the work that you do, and actually how you do that work. I mean, you're a privileged group of people in many ways. You actually are getting the inside. And you and how you do your work can actually make a huge difference. It isn't going to be just the technology. My whole life, I watched that whole thing happen. Uh, yet, 
without the individuals who had the imagination to actually apply those tools and that science, it wouldn't have happened. So I, I guess I'll simply say in conclusion, history will tell whether we are, as a, as a group of specialists, you might say, uh, successful. And so I'm hoping, more than hoping, I trust that we will be successful and get over this huge bunch of challenges that we have. So it's, thank you, Nadine, yeah. actually. Thank you all. The future starts here, and I'm hearing it starts with you. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you again for being here and sharing your thoughts and thanking the audience in the Now it is my pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker. Gilman Louie is a partner at Alsop Louie Partners and the CEO of America's Frontier Fund, a nonprofit that invests in foundational technologies critical to U.S. national security. Mr. Louie has over 30 years of national security and investment experience. He served as an early CEO of NQTEL, as an expert to the Defense Innovation Board and as a commissioner on the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence. Listen to this. Mr. Louie is currently the chairman of the National Intelligence University, chairman of the Federation of American Scientists, a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board, and a member of the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. I don't know how you had time to be here today, but we're glad that you are. Please welcome to the stage, Gilman Louie. Look, it's great to be here in St. Louis um, for a number of reasons. Uh, this is the geospatial capital of the world, and we should own it. And I think St. Louis has more to offer than just its technology. It really has to offer its talent and its wisdom. And in that context, I want to talk a little bit about generative AI, because that's on the minds of everybody. I don't know any college professor, any high school student who doesn't know ChatGBT, right? We now go to ChatGBT for everything. It's as if the search box never existed. And whether it's researchers, whether it's folks in government or individuals, we are having conversations with algorithms to inform potential possibilities, to interrogate, to go back and forth in a different kind of relationship with the machine than we've had in the past. Now, what's interesting is for this current new generation, we think all of this is new, but the reality of ChatGPT goes way back to the early 60s when we had this little toy we call Eliza which had exactly the same interface. It was this little block of code we wrote in this language called BASIC that mimicked a psychologist. And we interacted with it, and for about five minutes, it could fool you that it was a real person behind the, you know, the curtain, but it really wasn't. This is a different world. And AI today is not your father's Oldsmobile of the past. And I want to walk through not only the impact, but how generative AI and its future derivatives will fundamentally change how we think about geospatial. It is not just about how it enhances geospatial, but actually fundamentally change it. And so my, my discussion is really about moving away from the old frameworks of geospatial intelligence to real geo knowledge. Right? This idea of geography and understanding geography fundamentally as it affects every one of our decisions today. Now imagine 20 years ago when we were talking about the Ram McNally, you know, trying to drive with this big book in your face as you're kind of going down the freeway trying to figure out where you are. And now how we've integrated all of that in everything. It's in our pockets, right? It's in our cell phones. The things that were not mentioned is I'm on the board of Maxar, which provides a lot of the imagery, 
but I'm also on the board of Niantic, which does Pokemon Go. Right? To imagine that we could generate billions of dollars in revenues by having digital characters running around in a physical world that people are happy to give me their money for every minute of the day. <laughs> so it's a whole new world that's in front of us. So what am I talking about in geo-knowledge? It's not about maps, and it's not about imagery. It's about taking any point in space or any region in space, this X, Y, and Z point that we can admire and project it from over a period of time, from the past to the present and to its potential into the future. And knowing everything about this point that's relevant to why I'm interested in it at this moment. It has context. It has knowledge. It has information. It has truth. And being able to interrogate that point or that space is why we're all here. Now, trillions of dollars have been made in the industry over in information technologies built around the search box. We have yet to organize the world's data geospatially. There's no place you can go on the internet today where you can start, you, you might go to Google Earth, you might go to Esri, right, are all different peaks at what the world may be, but to be able to say, give me all the information about this point in space and this point in time that I'm interested in the past or in the future, give me the answer, it doesn't exist. So that's the great opportunity. It's a great opportunity for our war fighters, it's a great opportunity for our consumers, it's a great opportunity for knowledge and science and discovery. And if we can do that, we can project out into the future. Now, I just want to give you a quick review of kind of AI by the numbers. And I bring this up because specifically large language models are greatly misunderstood. Large language models are the foundation of generative AI. First thing you should know, it's big business. Why is that important? Because when there's $2 trillion riding on it, investors, entrepreneurs, talent, and industry will go rushing down to solve real problems. So for all of you who have parents who say, why don't you get a real job? You can tell them <laughs> that that's what you're doing. You're going to be defining a new industry that fundamentally doesn't really exist today. Now let's talk about generative AI in some greatly misunderstood numbers and principles. Principle number one, historically around artificial intelligence, was that data wins, right? We all talked about data repository, having exquisite data, making sure our data warehouses are clean, that we do ETL transformations, right? It's all about the data. The Chinese bet on data. If you look at all the things that the Chinese are doing, it's all about the data. And what did the ChatGPT team do? They changed it around. They said it wasn't about data. It was about compute. And whoever has the most compute is going to win the day. That's why when you hear things from our Commerce Department about restrictions of certain kinds of microprocessors to be shipped out overseas, it's because the fundamental understanding is that compute gives you knowledge. So the idea of generative computing is not about specialized data sets. Yes, they do help. But it's about integrating and digesting all the world's information to build a model that costs, by the way, billions of dollars to build. These are not cheap. This is not something you do in your mom's kitchen. To build a large language model that's relevant Google estimates it's going to take for the next iteration five to $10 billion. So it's not cheap. The other thing is, once you compute the large language model to actually run the model, we'll be able to run it partly on the iPhone 16. In other words, one generation away, I can put the entire large language model of GTP, uh, GPT-4 actually in my pocket with no connectivity. From a warfighter point of view, from a consumer point of view, from an intelligence point of view, that's a game changer. 
Okay. Love. Here's the fundamental impact that we're going to have see that takes place. Yes, this list is really important. You should all copy it. You should all write it down, right? It's, we can use generative AI to improve imagery. We can do super high resolution enhancements. We can take it and fill in the data blanks where data is missing. We can use generative AI, right, to perfect some of our neural AI models. We can use generative AI to do scenario generation. But the most powerful thing about generative AI, right, is it's flaws. Now, why did I say this? Anybody who's used generative AI knows it has prone to this thing we call hallucinating, right? So my favorite is I put my name in, and it actually comes back with a set of results. And I said, ask ChatGPT, where are all the awards I have won over the years? And it gives me a list, and it gets about 90% of them right, and there's 10% that I have never won. <laughs> but it says I've won them. So I take that list. When I'm wearing my White House badge, I go to the White House, and I say, you owe me 10 new awards. <laughs> right? Because this is what ChatGPT says. That hallucination is fundamentally the computer imagining, being creative. It does, it's just like my 18-year-old daughter. Sometimes she doesn't distinguish what she's thinking from reality. She blends those two things together. It's kind of like ChatGPT. But we can leverage that because those missing points could be the solution to any particular problem. So there's a whole field of research right now thinking through how do we solve and make it not hallucinate? What we should be doing is taking those hallucinations as solution potential sets for solving classes of problems to fill in data points that are currently missing. The other thing that generative AI does is it allows us to compress time, right? Because what we're doing with the machine is temporarily we are collapsing the past the current and the future into a single state. And I'll explain why this is really critical for what we got to do in the world that we have going forward. Now, here's some things that are different. As I said earlier, it's not about the data. And by the way, generative AI is not the solution for everything. Here's a couple observations that Google and the OpenAI team has noted, and we should be very aware of this. While a narrow AI model can outperform a generative AI model at a moment in time, within one turn of the crank to the next generation of runs on the LLMs, the next generation LLMs will always outperform the narrow AI performance. So we should be very thoughtful about putting too much trust in a narrow model. It doesn't mean that neural models don't have applications, but what it really says is us understanding and perfecting how we build these generative AI models, these new LLMs, will be transformative and will give us huge competitive advantage, whether it's in industry or whether it is in military applications, in government, or any other decision process we make. Because what generative AI arms us with is time advantage is able to ingest large amounts of information that fundamentally does not require a complete model of the world to lead you to solution sets that you did not think was possible. And for all you research out, researchers out there, the Monte Carlo approach of search tree searching is fundamental to why these systems work. Now. We've grown up on the stack. Anybody who's worked in the geospatial world has always embraced the stack. And this is the stack we all are familiar with in the geospatial reality in which we do many of our works. And we always start with this idea of base knowledge, right? a base map, a base layer. Well, the challenge with that mindset is that there is a base. There is something that's immutable that does not change. There is nothing in the world that does not change. 
everything, including our bodies, are affected by time. So if we build a stack on a base model, we are fundamentally already obsolete on whatever that model comes back and tells us about. The second point about the stack, it is built about our human understanding of the world. So we build layers that humans can understand. The sensors who are picking up energy from either an aircraft, outer space, or from your phone, right, has to go through a bunch of transforms so our idiot brains through our Mark I eyeballs can understand what's going on. The machine, as we all know in AI, doesn't need to have that transform. In fact, every time we do the one of these transforms, we lose information, we lose precision, because you're trying to get it to human understanding. It is also built on sensors. So each part of our stack, many of our layers, are based on the sensor that's collecting the information. It's the SAR collection platform. It is the multispectral collection platform. It's the EO platform. It's going out and taking text data and putting a geospatial stamp and transform that into each one of these layers. What does generative AI do? It takes that stack and munges it all together in the stew that potentially can give you information. It potentially can create new layers, a new way of presenting information that gives you a competitive advantage. It could take SAR, it can take EO, and create a completely different synthetic layer that video gamers understand, right? If you, how many people here own a Tesla or an EV? Raise your hand. Okay, for those people, you, you know, when you're driving around, and you're looking at the screen when you should be looking out the window, but, but you're looking at the screen, right? What do you see? As you're driving along, you see this 3D toy-like car on the, on the screen. You see uh, a dummy-like individual who represents a person walking across the street. You're seeing a symbolic representation of the world in which the sensors are seeing and is using for interpretation because it needs to understand not to hit that dummy because that dummy is a real person, right? Not to hit that car, not to miss that turn or drive into that tree. It simplifies the information so that the algorithms can make faster decisions. It's, it also simplifies the information so humans are not data overloaded, right? So this idea of all we need to do is add more pixels to the imagery for us to have a better understanding of the world, that may be true in the analytical framework if time didn't matter and your decision process requirements were near to infinite. And this was the key point. We have a whole generation growing up on real-time information, right? We all grew up with the Encyclopedia Botanica and the World Book Encyclopedias, right? Our kids look at that, and my, my, my son kind of went to my mother's home and pulled out, like, what are these things? What's in an encyclopedia? What's an atlas? Right, because that's the old way in which we need the information. What we need today is what piece of information that I need about this XYZ point in time that I need to make a decision on now. Currency, whoever can make that faster decision wins all. For all those who are in trading of stocks, we all know that a handful of microseconds gives you trade advantage that yields hundreds of millions of dollars in returns on investment if I'm a stock trader. Because I can get that information slightly faster than the other person. I can make that execution on that trade faster than the other person. I win the trade. If I am a warfighter sitting in the F-35, if I can reach out and touch somebody before they can reach out and touch me, I'm going to win the fight. In a world where information is hidden, it's camouflaged, it's misdirected, in a world where information is imperfect and truth is sketchy, 
being, having that information and getting resolution on that information, and I'm not talking about pixels, resolution as an information leads me to faster decision making. Now, I'll just say this to all the warfighters in the room. We're bending on things like stealth and the hypersonics. What does that really mean? It means about compressing the decision loop time for our adversaries so that they are unable to respond from the moment they get resolution. In other words, we have a saying, you're kind of waking up dead. You do not want to find your first understanding of the, of the world is when the missile is striking your tail. The same thing is true when you're driving around. You don't need that information of where the gas station was three seconds when the gas station was behind you. You need to know when it's going to be ahead of you. And you need algorithms that predict what the potential futures are. For any of you who play hockey or play sports, right? You tell the quarterback to throw the ball to where the receiver is going. You hit the puck to where the, dry, the forward is actually going to drive that puck in to the, into the net. It's not just about where we are at this moment. It's about where we're going to be in the context of what we're trying to get done. Real-time systems are going to be driven by next-generation hardware. Okay, so by 2028, we will all have glasses with information in our heads. Literally, we'll put using waveguides and next-generation compute, right? You won't walk around with these things that look like ski masses, as Apple hopes that case may be. But we will have that, right, in a pair of normal-looking glasses. We will have it directly in our headsets, right? So Siri is going to be predictive. It'll, Siri will know where you're going in the context of your daily life and give you recommendations. It will be your Radar O'Reilly. It will answer your question before you have the question. That's the future that we're heading to. So that kind of comes down to some areas of research which we need to talk about. There's a lot of things we don't have. Fundamentally, we do not have the data architecture and information infrastructure that organizes the world's data geospatially, that's in recall mode, that's able to recall that information in nearly instantaneously and in context. Whoever builds that system not only will make billions of dollars, and please give me a call because I would really love to invest in you, but also fundamentally, we need to have that architecture or we're going to need to drive our systems to the future, whether it's government systems, defense systems, or information systems. We need to understand also the difference between conjecture and truth that comes out of these algorithms. So we need a lot more research on information validation. Again, it's sort of like my daughter. I need to have a filter on what she says. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> but if we can invest in, the fil in that filter to say, this is speculation, hallucinating, this is truth. Here's the truth fact pattern behind it. Even though the algorithm didn't use that pattern to come up with that answer, we need a different validation model. We need digital twins that actually model the world so that we can take these scenarios, run them a million times, and optimize them in the real world context, and helping us in decision support loops. And we need to understand the human machine interface, because the danger here is we create another Tesla. And I know this, I live in San Francisco, everybody has a Tesla. Every solar Prius is, they all have Teslas now. Nobody has a BMW. If you have a BMW, you're old. Right? Everybody has a Tesla. And I watch, there's a freeway called 280 in San Francisco that goes from Silicon Valley to San Francisco. All the p drivers of these Teslas not paying attention as they're in autopilot mode. Until it works 99.99% of the time until it doesn't work. And as you're going 65 miles an hour into a barrier that's made of concrete, you do not have enough time between when the machine kind of goes, I don't know what the hell is going on, to when you're paying attention, you're already dead. 
So that human UI interface of knowing what to trust, when to trust, and when to ask it more questions needs to be understood, and it's the soft sciences that need to understand that. The soft sciences of how we process data in our heads based on when the machine is putting that information in our heads. And the last part that's really, really important, and that is the ethical uses of these technologies. If we're gonna rely on these machines to help us make decisions, in some case, make the decisions for us, because there's not enough time for us to humanly respond, then we need some ways to think about, it's not just about guardrails, right? How do we embed our ethical values into these algorithms? That's the difference between us and our peer competitors. It's the thing that makes us Americans versus somebody else. We hold these truths to be self-evident, needs to be built into our algorithms. And if we're successful, we will transform the world. And the world will be running on our technologies, not somebody else's that may not have that same ethical framework, that same sense of truth, the understanding of reliance that we will all draw our decision and information from. So with that, open to Q&A. I have the pleasure of conducting the Q&A with you, as I said to you earlier. Well, what you said just blows my mind. You know, when I was a journalist, we always had this, this name called Joe Q Public, that you have to talk to Joe Q Public. And you touched on it a little bit for, but I'm Joe Q Public, so how is this going to really change my life and when? You, you know, I think what's important is our understanding of not just how much we rely on these technologies today. I mean, there's, uh, if, if you have an iPhone versus Android, I think Android has the same app. It comes back and tells you how much screen time you spend on your device, right? It, it was supposed to help parents, quite frankly, control their teenagers, but it turns out the parents are even more abusers than their kids, right? And so if you're kind of, when I was growing up, it used to be the boob tube, right? Yeah. How many hours do you spend in front of the TV where the average person back in the old days would spend somewhere between four and eight hours in front of the television set? Okay, we haven't progressed very much. We're just, putting, we're just changing the screen into what the we smaller put, screen. Into the smaller screen. The difference is we didn't rely on the boob tube to make real-time decisions. Right. We're relying on the boob, our version of the boob tube to make real-time decisions. It's not just decisions for myself. When I hook up to the social graph, I'm influencing everybody in my graph, right? And so the consequences of mistakes, misinformation, disinformation, or us just thinking that we're agreeing with something that goes through an algorithm that then changes how everybody right. else gets that information. That's why I don't use chat GPT <laughs> right. that much. It, it, Scares me. I mean, if you're using Amazon, regardless, you're informing an AI algorithm, right? That's true. So now, fast forward into the future, when that information isn't, requires you to actually do one of this, turn on your phone and press mm -hmm. this, and then when it's here all the time, where all the sensors are integrated between our physical sensors, our environmental sensors, and the world's data, that's game changing. And so people are asking, what's that going to be like? I just go to science fiction. You know, it's the computer talking to James T. Kirk. It's R2-D2 talking to Luke Skywalker. That isn't 100 years away. That's five years away. And we, we, we better be prepared for it. And, and what we're trying to do in the, you hear a lot of us technologists mm -hmm. talking about this. You know, you have the head of Google, the Microsoft, right? They're all, all going on. And it kind of quietly, Elon Musk, whispering, you know, we're building this stuff, it's gonna be really, really great, but you know, we're a little bit scared too. That's because, that's because look, we, we live, as I was saying earlier at breakfast, we're living our 1984 moment right now. I mean, you know, we've introduced Apple Macintosh in 1984 and we built 1984. 
right? A lot of the world's problems are driven by these technologies that we thought was going to be, you know, helpful for democracy. And it, turn, it turns out that in many cases, it's not. So my question is, should I be happy about this? <laughs> Concern, how should I react to all of this? You should be both, right? Mm -hmm. well, look, it's an exciting new world. The, the, the potential for the ability to help educate an individual regardless of where he or she lives, regardless of their economic status, mm -hmm. that we can have ma machine algorithms actually tune information so we can learn faster, we can make better decisions, we can be uh, better uh, advocates for democracy is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. The ability to put, you know, a doctor in your pocket, extremely powerful, right? But we have to build these systems knowing that there are consequences on how we build these systems, what information we draw from, mm -hmm. and how those answers are shaped, right? It is, there is no, information, we just provide the information, we, we don't, you know, that's all we do. That right. world will not exist in the future. Because Everything will be conscious. As you said, it's the validation and the ethics of it. Exactly right. We have a question here. It was mentioned that Siri will be in our glasses and earbuds, essentially directing our lives. What do you think the effect will be on human cognition? We have already forgotten how to memorize phone numbers. I can, yeah, I'm one of those. My husband can't navigate STL, St. Louis, without navigation anymore. Where is the line? Okay, that's the downside, but here's the upside. The upside is I don't need to be an expert to do things that were not possible. I have a higher order of function. Now for anybody who have children, this thing about 30 years ago, could we imagine our children building robots, programming them? Every kid, we got Lego Mindstorm. So our ability to use higher order cognitive skills like design and creativity gets unlocked because the keepers of information, right, the, 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 the folks who you had to go to to ask for permission to create something, you don't need them anymore. And, and so, in some weird way, the, art, the artisan class could be a renewal for mankind because the artists will be back. There's a reason why design schools are over-enrolled throughout the country, right? It's higher order thinking, right? From a strategic level, what's the difference between the F-35 and a SU-35, other than one is made in Russia and one is made in the US. The difference is the pilot isn't just flying the aircraft. The pilot is orchestrating the battle with the screens that are in front of her and the information that's projected right into the helmet as she's looking right through her aircraft. Our ability to process information faster than our adversary means our adversaries are sitting ducks. Yeah. Right? Information wins. Information at speed is an advantage. This is our F pole advantage. And information in context allows us to use our one thing that we have over the machine. And that's our conscious and our ethical understanding of the world around us that makes us human. Team with the machine gives us superior capability. We'll end it on that note, on that high note. Thank you so much, Thank Gilman you. Louis, for being here. We appreciate it. A round of applause. So now it's time for a 30 minute. So our first panel today is focused on the rewards, risks, and regulations of artificial intelligence in the geospatial science. The moderator for this panel is Mark Munsell. Mark serves as the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Deputy Director of the Data and Digital Innovation Directorate. Formerly, he was NGA's Chief Technology Officer and the Deputy Director of the Chief Information Officer IT Services Directorate. 
In all of these roles, Mark facilitates innovative development aimed at transforming and modernizing NGA's technology to better serve its mission partners, as well as overseeing and streamlining IT-related capabilities and services. Please welcome Mark Munsell, who will introduce our panel. Welcome back, everybody. We've got a great panel for you here. Go ahead and come on up, everybody. We have Dalton Lunga, who's going to introduce himself um, from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories. We have Abby, who is uh, assistant professor at St. Louis University. And we have Patrick Wilson, who is a vice president uh, with MediaTek. And the first thing that we did right is we got the right order as we came up. So congratulations on that. Go us. The first thing that I noticed was that uh, apparently St. Louis University used ChatGPT to uh, get my biography, which is obviously uh, in the 10% incorrect. <laughs> so uh, whoever can update ChatGPT Chat for us, somebody call uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI who, by the way, is a St. Louis native, went to John Burroughs High School here. So uh, Gil, if you can just chat him real quick. Yep. And see if you can update my biography, which will probably only cost a billion dollars, right, to, to rebuild that foundational model. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to start with um, uh, the panel here. They're actually going to do more in-depth introductions of themselves. And they're going to start with you know, describing their hopes and dreams for this technology based in the work that they're currently doing, um, the research that they're doing, um, and the uh, products that they're, that they're building. So Dalton, please go ahead and introduce yourself and give us an idea about what you think the awards of this technology will be in the geospatial domain. Sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dalton Lunga. I lead a geospatial AI group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So my, my team and I, we've been creating AI tools and deploying these tools for transformational of geospatial data towards actionable, actionable uh, you know, insights, supporting a lot of national security applications. What's behind uh, what I like to say as the big motivation behind what we do is, as Guillaume mentioned earlier on, how to reduce the latency between data generation to decision making. So a couple of examples that my team has worked on, you know, when you look around, you know, the frequency intensity of natural disasters is on the increase. And, you know, all this is due to climate change. There's a lot of destruction to property that's taking place, loss of lives. And when you look at our government, one of the things that's key in terms of responding to natural disasters is how well prepared they are you know, the first responders, you know, you talk about recovery response, they need tools that can help them to be able to attend to those situations in time. Up to about 2017, the US uh, government did not have a comprehensive database that would help with the efficiency of determining, you know, the accuracies to assess the impact of damages across the infrastructure. So my team had that opportunity to work on a project via the Department of Homeland Security, a project that had looked at mapping all the infrastructure across the US and looking at you know, buildings from the size of about 450 square, square foot. We've been able to do that over the course of five years. To date, we've mapped about 125 million buildings across the US and gone beyond just having the footprints, but also attributing the functional use of these buildings. That data is now critical to DHS for mitigation purposes. It, it's now underpinning the response and recovery that FEMA is using to attend uh, to natural disasters when you see wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes. The time that those teams are taking to be able to respond has been compressed as a result of having access to that data. Another example that I can also mention is with the ongoing conflict in, in Ukraine. At some point last year, we worked on a project that sought to map all the grain storage facilities across U Ukraine so that we could help with estimating the impact of the war as it was going on. 
and we were able to have that data that mapped all the silos in collaboration with the Yale University. The insight that came out there was one in six of those storage facilities were impacted, were either destroyed, damaged, or within the Russian control. So that insight was useful in kind of like projecting as the war is going on, what does the future of food security looks like? Having said that, I think I'm not, I would like just to paint a timeline in terms of the evolution that I've witnessed within AI and its impact to geospatial. So when you look at the crisis management and the food security uh, applications that we developed in Ukraine, these are tools that we're able to build using what we call supervised machine learning, meaning that we're able to classify and detect patterns in data. The human performance that we hear you know, in the media is due to those types of tools. That's like a decade backwards looking at uh, AI. When you move over to you know, the past, say, five years, as we had from the keynote uh, attack, generative AI tools have been coming up. Right. Now we've gone beyond just being able to classify the patterns, you know, think of you know, when you have a pile of data, you have this AI that's acting as a metal detector to look for the needle in the hashtag, but now we can understand what is in the data to a point where we can generate new content. Right. So with that cap type of capability, you know, there's an upside. We heard about you know, the perils that are potentially lying ahead in new applications. We are starting to think about how to design systems that we can control so that we can safeguard as we deploy and understand what are the risks that underlie these types uh, of deployments. So when, you look, when I look at the future, I, I foresee a future where we have a lot of emphasis in terms of human machine teaming, you know, adaptive intelligence tools that will help us to understand beyond just you know, generating new content or classifying, but also planning and reasoning with scenarios that we've not yet seen. So that kind of AI is what excites me, and I think this discussion is very timely for us to, to engage on. No, it's amazing, and, and I know a lot of this work at Oak Ridge has been built on many years, like sort of layer after layer of layer of knowledge and, and, and work that's been done. But the fact that um, you can detect, or use computer vision to detect millions, right? Millions and millions of buildings. Right and easily determine, some level of ease, determine what's happened to those, and apply that same technology to something as important as uh, food storage right. in Ukraine. Right. No, it's, it's fascinating, it's amazing, and you know, I, I know that our agency really appreciates the partnership that we have with Oak Ridge and your research, but I'm sure that Abby uh, is very upset now that you've taken all of the Great ideas that uh, we've, we've all come up with. What's interesting about Abby is she's working in a different domain of research that is equally as important um, and fascinating and has the potential of, uh, of a different kind of uh, award. I, I, appreciate Abby. The, I, I appreciate the introduction. It, it is a hard act to follow uh, that description of the work going on at Oak Ridge. Um, so I'm Abby Stiliano. I am an assistant professor of computer science here at St. Louis University and a fellow of the Taylor Geospatial Institute. Uh, my work is in sort of very broadly computer vision and machine learning and AI, um, but very specifically I work on global scale image search. So if I have an image, how can I find other images in a pile of hundreds of millions of other images uh, in order to do different things? Um, so in particular, the thing that I think about is how we can help combat child sexual abuse and human trafficking uh, by recognizing the places where victims are being photographed. Uh, they are very often photographed in hotel rooms, and it turns out that recognizing hotels is a challenging visual recognition problem. You might have two hotels within the same room, uh, within the same hotel rather, that are visually pretty dissimilar. One floor was renovated and another wasn't, and the only thing that actually matches is the lamp that gets left after the renovation. And how can you build tools that can isolate that very, very specific feature? On the flip side, every Motel 6 in the United States has been renovated to look virtually identical. <laughs> and, and so these challenges actually make it a, a really interesting vision problem that I have spent the last several years working to build models to address. And, that has been very satisfying. I feel lucky that I'm here at St. Louis University where there's a real emphasis on mission and making sure that we are building tools that sort of help society. Um, 
I think sort of in the broader context, this is where I see that the real opportunities of AR, AI are. And it's not that I, I disagree with anything Dalton said. This is absolutely everything was slam dunk. Um, but I think we've all been in this field long enough that we, we know that things kind of didn't work for a really long time in general in computer vision until about 2012 things essentially did not work at any scale. Um, and the last decade we've th seen things sort of transition, the supervised learning revolution that Dalton referred to sort of driven by ImageNet and these sort of benchmark models has been really, really impactful. I think now going forward thinking about what do these generative models mean for us and how can we use all of this to help sort of the people among us that are most vulnerable is a really driving factor for me. I, I think in some ways they are the most vulnerable to these systems as well. Um, so I, I may be the biggest AI skeptic in the room actually, despite the fact that I am an AI uh, researcher and practitioner. I, I worry a lot about these models are built entirely based on huge, huge troves of data with lots of biases and lots of issues. Everything that we have that is problematic about humanity is now built into these models because we trained them on the data that came from humans. Uh, and so, so we're gonna talk about the risks. So I, I view this as a huge opportunity to think about how we can use these models to help the, those among us who need it most. Um, and on the flip side, making sure that we protect them as well. Um, so I specifically think about this human trafficking problem. Um, I know that we can sort of generalize what does it mean to be sort of vulnerable populations. Um, I, I think about all of the opportunities that AI gives us for things like food security and for curing cancer. And I am very optimistic about the future. I may have more things to say when we yeah. get to the risk section as well. So Abby, I'm gonna have you, <clears throat> just to warn you, I'm gonna have you lead that off when we come back around. <laughs> oh, sounds good. Okay, Patrick, a uh, little, bit, little bit different. You're not a researcher. No. Um, Patrick uh, uh, runs the government relations business at, at MediaTek, which is a hardware manufacturer, chip manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as, as Gil said uh, before, it's, this is all about compute, um, it is. and obviously that demand signal and how you support that is is certain. You know, obviously a great opportunity for your company, right? It's a positive sure. future. I think um, the whole the whole industry is thinking about the addressable market, right? What's driving people's uh, adoption of technology? How they put it to use? How it improves their lives? Ultimately, technologies that are uh, ubiquitous, right? They're ubiquitous because they're useful. Right, uh, uh, really powerful, cool technologies that are novel and nobody wants. That, there's a different file for that, right? And it, it, it's very quickly sorted. Um, I will say uh, thank you very much uh, to St. Louis University, to the foundation for inviting an industry person uh, to come. And I will say that uh, as is my normal day job, uh, I am very comfortable being the stupidest person in the room uh, as a non-PhD. Uh, a mere lawyer and a lobbyist at that. Uh, what I actually do every day is I explain politics to engineers yeah. and engineering to politicians, right? And both have little interest in the work of the other, except that it's now hard to miss. So I think I was invited to the panel today to give you a bit of an industry perspective and how we see AI and certainly the opportunities uh, for us to help our customers solve problems, use AI for good, which is a big part of our driving force. I'm here at a moral institution today, and I thought that on behalf of industry, I should say that the semiconductor industry is very mindful of the opportunity to use technology for good, and that's a part of our history. But um, I, I wanna say something different, I guess, in the opportunities category, because I think um, right now, maybe our focus is too intensely directed at all of the cool tools that come out of the software that we want to use uh, AI to solve. But I wanna change the direction of that gaze and make you look instead to the actual semiconductor devices themselves. Because compute is the actual underlying technology. Everything else is possible. So one of the things that you don't hear a lot of people talk about is that chip design is the most incredible thing in human history, right? 5,000 engineers working for two years across the globe is just the normal way that we design a leading edge chip. MediaTek is the fifth, depending on the count, the fourth or fifth largest 
fabulous semiconductor company in the world. We have about 22,000 employees worldwide. We only are focused on making the next generation of chips. But what I just told you is true. 5,000 engineers working exclusively for two years to make one device a little bit better than the last one. What we're seeing for AI, we have been using artificial intelligence within our company, right, to improve the performance of that engineering. And what we have seen over our time in using AI is roughly a 5% performance improvement for every period of iteration. Wow. Stacking. Wow. Right? So if you thought you were good at finding image analysis and you got 5% better every five minutes, five hours, five days, five months, you see where this is going, right? And I would say for the last 10 years that I've been in the semiconductor industry, there's been a lot of writing and talking about, oh, Moore's law is slowing, right? We're not going to be able to keep up, you know, this doubling. If you're not familiar, I urge you to ask ChatGPT, explain to me what Moore's law is, so you can do that on your own time. But Moore's law is a principle of both economics and uh, technology that allows us to double the capability about every two years, 18 months to two years of your chips. That's why you need to buy a new phone every two years. Thank you for that. Um, what we're seeing with AI is that's going to accelerate. We're going to have more powerful compute faster. We're going to make engineers that today are entering the industry, we're going to improve their performance ability right, to make more powerful chips. And it's going to make all those other solutions possible. So if what you're really talking about is crunching maps to put it down to something and analyzing it, pattern analysis, the good news is you're going to get a lot more of it. Because the ability to process images, to uh, identify patterns, which is really what we're about, that is going to increase exponentially because Moore's law is about to increase. I will call it right here. We are literally on the cusp of the greatest technological change since the Industrial Revolution began. Uh, the next 25 years of chip design is going to be shocking. Yeah. No, I agree, and All I right. think it's really fascinating where we're at. I, uh, I want to riff off a little bit, uh, it's a little bit audible here, uh, panel, be, be warned. Um, so it, in our industry, um, the geospatial industry specifically, we rely a lot on sensors. We rely a lot on um, satellite, satellite imageries. Um, <clears throat> and there hasn't been a lot of talk, interest, energy behind designing the new uh, generation of satellites to do artificial intelligence. It's still kind of, hey, we're gonna, our satellites are still gonna be mostly for humans. Right? And, you know, because some of these plans started five, six, seven years ago. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of energy in redesigning those sensors and satellites to this specific te technology. You are getting a very high demand signal to redesign chips for this purpose. Is that right? Yeah. People want AI in their phone, right? Right now, AI is very distant. Right, it's in a computer somewhere. We were talking earlier about GPU, and everyone's very focused on these supercomputers like they have at Oak Ridge. But those are very narrow band of users who can use that. The idea that in only a few years, you're going to have a powerful AI tool in your pocket, right? And to be able to not only build the compute, but to connect to networks with Spectrum and other things to do that. Um, more to the core of your question, though, Mark, and that is, I think any government any part of the IC or DOD needs to be aware that you are riding on consumer technology. The reason you have GPU available to do these AI tasks is because 10 years ago, 13-year-olds wanted ever cooler video games, right? Luckily, video games are awesome, and people are making billions of dollars designing ever cooler video games. If that didn't happen, you know, your mission would be in trouble, right? And to, for, for, I think for government to understand that you're riding on this consumer demand, right, and that you need it, you not only need it, but to leverage that, you have to have the private sector serving their customers aggressively, because that's how you can quickly uh, use the tools yeah. for other cooler things that are unique missions. I think the other piece of this when we think about the satellites that you're putting up versus the phones that you're buying, we are in this really, really transformative moment. I mean, if someone with a PhD in computer science or expertise in AI tells you that they know what things are going to look like, what the landscape is going to look like in a year, run the other way. I, we did not see, sort of as a field, 
the LLM transformation coming yeah. at the rate that it did. We did not see some of these things coming. And so when you're thinking about you know, consumer hardware, well, okay, if it changes in a year, no big deal. If you're putting a satellite up and now the hardware or the software that you've put on that is completely out of date within a year, that's a problem. And, yeah. and it's an engineering challenge too, to make technology like satellites upgradable, right? It's hard to get space, it's right. hard to do a launch. How do you extend the life and the practicality of really expensive assets like satellites? You need a plug and play modular system. So engineers are like, hey, can we figure out a way to dock a new system, right? An upgrade, uh, just like your apps on your phone get upgraded. How do we do that for hardware? And that's something that industry is gonna struggle with. Luckily, the demand for consumer products to make that happen is gonna drive all the investment. So by the time you need a solution, hopefully it'll be there. Yeah, Patrick, I, um, my family, myself personally, have been uh, uh, high demand consumers of GPUs over the years. <laughs> and uh, I remember <clears throat> struggling you know, a few years ago trying to get a decent GPU uh, for our video games uh, because of the demand from, from uh, industry. Yeah, the, the, the cloud computing companies and all of the folks trying to use, use these chips for artificial intelligence. And by the way, uh, Modern Good Warfare point. Season 6 started two hours ago. So for those of you that are, hopefully your download is happening, because it's some, something crazy like 22 gigabytes or something, so. <laughs> I look that for 2 a.m. Your <laughs> ISP provider would urge you to do that overnight, so. And you guys think I'm joking, that, that's real. That's, I really know that. I always make sure to do these things when I'm at SLU, so I can use the SLU network. SLU, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh -oh. We're gonna talk about ethics, too, later. Uh... I don't actually play video games. <laughs> I know, Abby, I know. And, and speaking of Oak Ridge, here's a funny anecdote. Um, a couple of years ago, I was down at the Million Pixel Challenge, Billion Pixel Challenge, it keeps going up, Trillion, trillion Pixel Challenge, yep. uh, which is uh, all the researchers on computer vision, sort of national laboratory researchers, and I asked them the question, what do you guys need? What do you need to do like what you're doing, Dalton, to, to do it better, right? To, to drive our F scores up to like 95%, to make quality, positive identification, what the director said earlier, which is our sort of ultimate goal to have the computer do this consistently. <laughs> and one after the other, they all said, more compute, more compute. Uh, you know, ironically, this is, they have the world's fastest supercomputer super there. And they all, they all wanted more. So is it still the world's fastest supercomputer? It is. So Summit is still number no, one? Frontier. Frontier, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, so that's but, the exascale. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we're, we're going to go to Abby here. We're going to start this risk discussion, which should be very interesting. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's fraught with promise and peril. Uh, you know, just exactly what, what Gil said earlier. Um, from, from a researcher point of view, you two especially, um, from scientists that are, have to do tests and evaluation of, of the things that you're working on, it doesn't seem like that's a solid science right now for us to do. And so where do you see the risks um, in that, Abby? And you know, can, you, can you riff off of that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about the test and evaluation in particular, I think we, we've got to do a little bit of nitty gritty getting to know some details about machine learning. So for some of you, this will be remedial for whatever machine learning course you may have taken. Um, but one of sort of the fundamental things is that you have data that you train on, which is like what makes your model work. And then you have data that you test on. And that is how you can measure, does that model that you trained on actually generalize to new data? And if it doesn't, then that model is worth nothing at all, right? You can't use it to make any new inference on any new data. And so the most important thing in machine learning is that your training data and your testing data must be separate. There, there can't be any mixing between those because then if you, know, if you trained on the data and you test on it, you don't know if it's actually gonna work for the new thing. And so when we think about these really, really huge models that are everything everybody is all excited about right now, we don't know what they're trained on, right? These are industry proprietary models where you don't know what they're trained on. Even if you have models that they could release, they are so large that we cannot interrogate them, right? We cannot go and look through every image that goes into stable diffusion. We can't read through every line of text that went into chat GPT. So we don't know what is in these models, and because we don't know what's in them, we don't know if there's any overlap between the data that we've trained on and what we've tested on. Uh, and so there's this really, really 
key issue that we have when we look at these huge models, that we can't evaluate them in any sort of robust scientific manner. Now, maybe if you're in this room, you, you don't care about that. Like, they work. Who cares, right, if we can't sort of measure the efficacy of them? This becomes really important as we sort of think about the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. How do you actually understand how they work? When I think about the risks, though, it's that first piece of it that is so concerning to me, um, that you don't know what is in them. Um, and these models are not, like, I want to make sure I don't come off as like, oh, those scary robots are going to come and take over the world, right? These are not doing anything other than pattern recognition and inferring distributions from high dimensional data. Uh, but we don't know what predictions they will necessarily make. And so if you don't know what data they're trained on and then you don't know exactly what inference they're going to make, that's really problematic. I heard a comment sort of in the keynote talking about, well, if you're a warfighter and you're using these models, if you don't know what w went into that model and you don't know exactly what predictions it can make, I'm not sure I think it makes a, a, it's a safe decision to be using them. Um, so this, this data issue to me is really key to the risks. Dalton, any ideas on what the big risks are here that you're facing or that we're facing? Yeah, um, just to, to expand on, on, on that. Um, so when I look at the risks, there's another side as well, the vulnerabilities that these models comes with. A lot of the tools that we are using, they all in the open, open space. So if you download a pre-trained model that's already available, you have no idea to even assess whether there's some nefarious components right. that were injected in those models. So if you go on to do the fine tuning, right. those nefarious components do carry over to wherever the decision you know, point is at. So that's one thing. Beyond just the models themselves, I also think about the data, the output that comes out of the data. I mentioned the Food Security Ukraine um, data that we provided. That data was useful uh, to pinpoint and as, you know, to help humanitarian agencies to assess you know, the damages. But the same data as is could have been used on the other side right. to actually locate which of the remaining facilities right. to drop, you know, uh, to, 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 to damage. So it's a full spectrum that goes beyond, I mean, just the data, but the models, and also how to make those models secure. When we have them within deployment production, what are the guarantees that we you know, build around these models to make sure that you know, they don't stray off, or if anybody is trying to you know, intrude with any invasive uh, you know, uh, attempts, those guarantees remain in place. Right. I mean, it absolutely is an arms race, right? It is. It's a bit like cyber when we think about, um, you know, hackers and defense. Um, <clears throat> the fact that all these open source models that are out there is a double-edged sword. Um, the fact that, uh, re, uh, you know, uh, students uh, in high school uh, can take an open source model and begin to do fine tuning, you know, train it to do other other sort of different things. Do their homework. Yeah, do their homework. Um, and at the same time, uh, those models can be right used to commit crimes and yeah. and uh, collect intelligence against us and things like that. So um, it's good. It's good and bad. Obviously, I think that um, the opportunities. I'll, I'll say I think the opportunities are greater than the risks. Um, but it's, it's probably to be determined. I think, uh, to jump in a, a, a second on the other side, because we're also focused in the tasks that are assigned to compute, right? So whatever the task is, and obviously that could be a high school student trying to get out of their presidential history paper and want to use ChatGPT, or criminals, right? Who can use, uh, they just give it a task and they can use it. Let's go to back to the other side, a different arms race. And this is something that I don't know if our audience has considered, but I think it's important to remember that AI for chip design is the opposite of ChatGPT, which wants to have as many users and inputs as possible, right? They want you all to stop what you're doing, use ChatGPT, because in the cycle of life for artificial intelligence, it's fail better, faster, infinity, right? That's what they're trying to do. Find out what's wrong. You're going to help correct the model and make it better. In chip design, it's actually a closed system, right? because our engineers and our proprietary designs are inside the castle, right? 
So we can only make our, our chip design models better within MediaTek. MediaTek people are making our AI universe, the inputs, better. So just as Mark said, it is an arms race. Unfortunately, he who has the most engineers wins, right? Because if you have the most number of engineers inside the castle who are users, they're gonna make the AI better, faster, and thus their designs are going to progress. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so this is a big challenge for the United States and for our close allies like you know, Taiwan. Other, I would just say the democrosphere, it's a big challenge. We need to produce more engineers. And the really bad news, and I'll pass it off back to my academic uh, uh, friends, is that electrical engineers in this country, the number that we produce has remained the same for 20 years. The exact same number of graduates. We have no improvement. Computer science, 25% on average over the last decade of growth. It's completely flat. That should concern us because other countries are exponentially improving not only the quality of their engineering education, but the yield and the number of engineers. So if it's an arms race and how many engineers you have inside the castle, this, the, the odds don't look good for us because we haven't committed it. And, and, and academia is trying to catch up. Our good friends at Purdue, uh, Media Tech is a partner with Purdue, they said out loud, they called their shot, and they said, we want to double in a decade the number of electrical engineers we produce for the semiconductor industry. We're going to do it. That's one university, but I think it's something that as a policy matter, um, the IC should be really concerned about that because you're going to need more engineers and you're going to compete with us. And, you know, don't tell anyone, because, uh, but we pay more. So, um, you know, it's, it, it is, uh, you have a great mission and that attracts a lot of engineers to want to come work for you and other related agencies, but you get my point, right? We're all fishing in the same pond. We have to grow the pool of skilled engineers who are going to help us design the technologies that will make AI of the future possible. Thanks, Patrick. Let me, so we've got about 11 minutes left. Um, I want to um, solicit for questions. So if you have the app out, um, you have an opportunity to get us questions. We're going to spend a few minutes, and Patrick, we're going to, this is probably mostly going to be focused on you, but we'll have the other panelists um, talk about this as well, about regulation. And so, you know, one of the most obvious um, examples of regulation out there uh, in the last couple of years are the, is the CHIPS Act. And then, uh, you know, I think the uh, White House and, and others are contemplating more, more rounds of regulation, both, you know, both from a CHIP point of view, but also in, in the AI models themselves. Um, what, what are your thoughts on um, should the United States be regulating this? And I, you know, how, I don't know if your, your company is prepared to answer this question. Not for um, us. I can say the industry does a lot of thinking about that, right, about um, you know, government's involvement. And I, um, we have a joke, and for those of you, there are some military folks here in the room, we, we always have a joke about um, on one axis of a chart you have enthusiasm, and on the other axis of the chart you have competency. Right, and so the real danger is low competency, high enthusiasm, right? And unfortunately, the semiconductor industry is very inscrutable, right? We don't, we're not obvious, and so right now, it is, I mean, last night, if some of you watched the GOP presidential debate, there was a question about semiconductors. I was just, you know, my heart was a flutter. I couldn't believe it, we're like, we're, they know us, you know, it's such a great thing, but for the most part, in engineering, you're suffering and you're, you're working in silence, right, in quiet laboratories across the world, and suddenly government's enthusiasm for semiconductors is really high, right, like a 10 out of 10, but they don't really know that much about our industry, and that's actually quite dangerous, right, because they're, you know, don't understand the global complexity, how every single thing we do, like I have a lot of conversations with uh, my friends in the DOD, because I, I forgot to say in my bio that I've been in the Army for 16 years and I'm a civil affairs officer, so explaining technology to senior officers, I do that too. And one of the things I always say is like, well, yeah, sir, but you know, <coughs> that chip is, you know, from a close trusted ally like Taiwan and it's finished in Europe and the engineer, engineering talent comes from Holland and it's all assembled in Connecticut and, you know, they don't like that. That's, that's spiraling out of the cycle of trust. And I say, no, actually complexity is your friend. A really complicated global supply chain is a good thing. That took me a while to get there, right? Like a whole minute to explain that. And sometimes in politics you don't get that. And so I guess back to your original question, um, Congress is a bit befuddled about what to do about AI. They've started to have some investigation about you know, moral use, and I still think government's number one tool is just oversight. 
asking companies, hey, how is this being used for nefarious purposes? How are you controlling it? Asking questions and information. From a regulatory standpoint on the application side, I think industry is, has decided, and I say that as a member of industry, but you know we're thousands of companies, large and small, but I think they've decided that on the education mission, we better go first. We better create some standards, and so there is a lot of work going on in industry. I'm proud to say the Semiconductor Industry Association Technology for Good is an initiative that we have, but the industry is gonna have to inform government so that they can make a better choice about where to draw lines and, and that sort of thing. And, that's very typical for regulation over history. Is it takes a lot of time for them to get to a place where they make a decision. You guys? Yeah. No, go ahead. You go. Uh, I, I think this complexity issue and how hard it is to get politicians to understand these things a, and end users to understand how they work. I, I mean, I will spend semesters trying to get my students to understand, you know, like we finish a deep learning class with transformer models, which are key to how these large language models work. It is really, really hard actually to explain to someone how they work. And if people don't understand how they work, it is hard for them to sort of understand what the capabilities are. And if they don't understand what the capabilities are, then they are vulnerable to, say, misinformation, right? If you don't know that it is completely capable today for somebody to generate a video of Joe Biden giving a speech saying that he is going to drop a nuclear bomb on Moscow in four minutes and have it look completely credible, then you are gonna be vulnerable to believing that. And so that, to me, is a risk both from the regulatory side and just a more general risk that these are such complex models that we can't help explain to politicians or to general end users what, how they work or what they can do. And so then people are going to consume the outputs of these not realizing um, that they're fake. There's been some dangerous tests of that, yes. right, using imagery particularly to see how long it will be you know, out in the wild, right? A, a completely inaccurate image that looks believable to see how long it takes. And I think that we're, I, mean, I think everybody, right? You, you understand, like, we're at a kind of delicate moment within democracy, right? Because there's a lot of distrust in institutions. And so I think for technology, we really have a grave responsibility to make sure people understand the technology, yeah. what the risks are, um, but also to give them tools to protect themselves because we want to prevent our adversaries, right, from utilizing these same tools, which are commercial and widely available, uh, to destabilize our democracy, undermine our universities, undermine public trust in key institutions. All of those things are risks that I think industry is grappling with. Yeah, Patrick, I've seen, right. I, I, I've heard some of our policymakers say they feel like they missed, and this is straight like from senators' mouths, um, they feel like they missed the boat with social media, like the government should have been paying more attention on the advent of that technology, especially with children's use and things like that, and they don't want to miss the boat here. They want to get out yeah. in front of it, and, and the director and I have had a chance to go down to the Senate, go down and talk to some of the lawmakers, and we do see a very concerted interest and effort to pay attention to this sort of moving forward. So, that, so I'll just encourage everyone that there, there is positive momentum. Dalton, I'll give you a chance to talk about this real quick. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, um, in a back to Patrick's point on the oversight, I think the government, is, government needs to go beyond just the oversight, um, you know, to build within its sphere the capability to be able to do the review of these technologies. They need to have R and D, you know, scientists that understand how these tools are working. Because, I mean, simply relying to the private sector, to me, uh, kind of like, I mean, you know, spells out that conflict of interest. The very same engineers that are designing these, we're asking them to kind of like, I mean, you know, advise the government on how to do the regulation. Yep. So there is that balance that I think needs to be. I agree. Yep. To be addressed. Yep, very good. Uh, how do you make trust a feature of products too, and I, I'm gonna say that again, right? When you walk in to buy a device, if you're in Best Buy or whatever, and you see them all lined up next to each other, you look at the features of technology. What's the capability of the chip? What's the m m memory? You know, all these components. Right now, consumers don't have a way of measuring trust because when we ask them, are you willing to pay more? for a trusted device, yeah. it turns out they are. So that mismatch from consumer demand for trust and industry's ability to meet it, 
that's what I think we're going to solve as an industry. Yes, you're right, regulation has, is a right place and government should have a role, but I think there's also meeting the market, right. right? Because people are hungry for trust. They want to know, where do my products come from? Do these people share my values? And there has to be a kind of UPC, I think, for, for trust so that you can value it. And if it has value, people pay for it, you'll get more of it, uh, is my philosophy. Speaking of trust and value, so I appreciate all of the questions. As soon as I uh, reminded folks, I got uh, about 50 questions here. So um, <laughs> It's a lightning round. We, Go. We a, we're down to three minutes. So what I'll do is uh, uh, trust and values, um, in, um, ethics, and, and I'm sort of uh, latching onto this particular question here, too. Um, this is about in, sort of environmental ethics. Um, uh, what's the panel's take on energy use demands of these models, uh, especially as they grow in generations, uh, you know, fu future generations? I know, obviously, you know, Oak Ridge is, you know, always <laughs> an energy coveting, lab, yeah. always wanting the world's largest, fastest supercomputer. Um, and obviously, Patrick, you, you know, you're looking to make chips that are more efficient. Um, and then, Abby, you're, you want as much power as you can responsibly to solve your, your particular issues. What do you guys think about this, Dalton? We are starting to pay attention. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier on about, about adapt, adaptive intelligence you know, capability. These are tools that are gonna be facing you know, the deployment. We hear about the constraints when you deploy these models on chips that do not have enough power, you can't actually deploy them. Right. So what we are do, doing from an R&D point of view is to start to think about energy efficiency as a component when we are testing the new architectures, I know right now you know, the hype is about big models, but we are thinking about how to compress them or even how to teach smaller models that can compute efficiently and still be able to make the same impact, however, with an emphasis on energy efficiency. So that's a very important topic. Abby? I, I struggle with this. I think there are trade-offs. Um, these models are extremely power hungry, right? I, I mean, the server farms that they- Especially to build them. What was that? Especially to build them. Building them, is it, right. So at inference time, not super hungry. Um, on the flip side, I use not the same scale of models, but large models to do things like understand bioenergy crops. Uh, and so I think there are ways in which these large models can help us to limit our energy consumption in other ways. Um, that we will have to weigh those trade-offs. But I, I think to Dalton's point, these models will get smaller. Patrick? Uh, uh, on the energy efficiency, obviously, this is a good dovetail with what I said before about consumers demand it, uh, but also just the feature size as, uh, you know, we're going to ship chips at three nanometers in the next six months, right? So as chips, their features get smaller, they must use less energy. So that is a problem. Obviously, there's leakages and just heat is the enemy of uh, all chip capacity. But it, I, I, the other thing is something I mentioned before about interoperability, the ability w to... Um, get more efficiency from sensors. One of the awesome things about the fact that we've driven down the price of sensors is if you haven't noticed, sensors are everywhere. Um, right now, I can pull out my phone and at our house in Virginia, which is currently empty, I can tell you, I can control my thermostat and what the temperature is room by room in my house in Virginia while I'm here. That's an amazing tool for energy efficiency and we're seeing that. Like, the utilities are having a problem because we're consuming less energy, but they need to spend more money. And it's the same for cars. The biggest crisis right now is energy efficiency yeah. in cars because we pay for our roads with gas taxes. Well, we're consuming less gas, so we're like, we need more roads because of you know EVs. Fascinating news article came out yesterday. Super Microsoft confusing. Is, <laughs> Microsoft is seeking nuclear engineers. Yes. Um, so that they can, they're sort of designing the future uh, data centers to run on nuclear power, so the, independent that, nuclear everything power. Everything sort of independent. They want to have power. these small modular reactors yeah. so that will just be there. It's just another, just another facet of how fascinating and how our world is changing so quickly from the demand of this technology. So I want to thank you guys. It was a great panel, very insightful, all the different um, angles uh, to approach this, and I think that I think our audience really appreciated this conversation. So, so thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, today's second panel focuses on the national security considerations of geospatial artificial intelligence. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Joe Lyons, who is Assistant Professor of Security and Strategic Intelligence at St. Louis University. Dr. Lyons is also the Director of the Security and Strategic Intelligence Program here at SLU, as well as Executive Director of SLU's Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence. I noticed that all of you involved in this field have so many different titles and involved in so many different things, which is great. Well, Dr. Lyons spent 14 years working in the U.S. intelligence community, beginning in 2001 with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. He has served multiple overseas tours in as an intelligence officer, thank you so much, before leaving NGA to pursue a university post posting. Please welcome Dr. Joe Lyons. I want to welcome everyone to our panel on AI and national security. And something exciting about today, as we uh, get ready to explore this topic, I thought we would involve AI in our question and answers. So some of the questions are generated by our team, some will be generated from the audience, and actually some will be generated by AI. And so let's see, I challenge the students out here, see if you can figure out which questions were generated by AI. And I'll let you know at the very end. To begin with, I uh, want to introduce our panel. I'm actually going to ask uh, each of them to introduce themselves, briefly talk about your, the role in your organization, and most importantly, what is your current interest or involvement in AI? Um, Dr. Alton? Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, Michelle Aiton from CIA. I'm currently the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Data Analytics in the Directorate of Digital Innovation. And my interests really are multifold. Um, we are very interested in any technologies or capabilities that can help us to accelerate and augment and automate our mission processes and workflows. Um, it is essential for us to be able to close the loop on all of the things that we need to accomplish and to essentially get ahead of our adversaries um, and make sure that we provide the absolute best solutions that we can as we provide national security for American citizens. John? Hi, I'm John Brennan. Uh, to answer Jack Dangerman's question, I think I first interacted with geospatial intelligence when I turned 16 and was able to join a land surveying crew. And my job was basically to machete all the branches out of the way so they could get a straight line to the point that they were trying to uh, measure elevation on. It's nice to see that the high school posters are focused on using ChatGPT to write Python code to transform red, green, and blue images. We've really come a long way with our high school education. Today I lead Scale AI's public sector business. We're an artificial intelligence company founded by Alexander Wang. He started focusing on computer vision in college when he was trying to figure out which of his roommates were taking his food from the refrigerator. Uh, we went on to provide computer vision models for self-driving cars, autonomy, and later on government uses. And since 2019, we've also supported the creation of large language models by contributing to GPT-2 and the LLMs ever since, focusing both on how to improve their performance, but also to reduce harms through test evaluation and red teaming. I'm delighted to be back in St. Louis, where my great-grandmother used to live and I used to visit every summer and uh, I'm pleased to be with you today. Captain Gateman. Hey, thanks everybody. It's been a pleasure to be here today. Captain Richard Mark Gateman. Um, I am a lifelong intelligence officer. Uh, my background has been in uh, support the special operations requirements management. I'm currently at NGA as the deputy director for the MAVEN program that you heard about already this morning, ensuring that we're getting CV, AI, ML, ML into the hands of the warfighter uh, to be able to ensure that we have that competitive advantage. Great, Captain Yateman, I think we're gonna start with you, and let's talk about the as-is state of AI. How is AI, specifically geospatial AI, currently being utilized um, to enhance national security? Well, that's a fantastic question. Currently, we are uh, partnered with most of our combatant commanders to ensure that we're getting the CAV, AI, and ML pieces into their hands to be able to ensure that battle space awareness increasing that ability to be able to see past traditional sensors, past the traditional 
um, framework in which we have fought for the last 50 years uh, into their hands to be able to ensure that they're able to affect decisions uh, and, and really kind of change the, the scope of it. But that's not just done at the high end, at the you know, top of the conflict. It's done in day-to-day -day operations. So um, that's where I think the MAVEN program has really been partnered with NGA in the, as a combat support agency is prepared to be able to do that going forward. John, do you have some use cases? If we think about what's happened to the warfighter, um, the staff was created in the early 1800s by the Prussian military. And for over a century, we had this analog staff that was able to keep up with the information that the commander needed to process. Beginning in the late 1980s, when we introduced Microsoft Office, it became a digital staff. And the, the numbers, for example, at the joint staff level were able to dwindle back down as people were able to do more with less and process that information. But in that same amount of time, since the introduction of Microsoft Word, the global data set has grown from one to 10 to 100 zettabytes. So we've had two orders of magnitude increase in the information we have to process, which means the humans need help. And we believe and others believe that we need to accelerate the uh, development of AI applications for this new generative staff that we're all gonna need in a human team, uh, human machine team kind of arrangement. So those are the, the problems of today. You know, how do you read thousands of pages in a millisecond and write a draft uh, as ChatGPT does? How do we use that safely and how does government test and evaluate it so that it knows the appropriate use each time? That's what's before us as a generation. And Michelle, I'm really excited to hear how is uh, CIA using um, artificial intelligence to enhance national security? Well, I think that um, we basically use it in every possible way. So in the geospatial context, it's optimal search, optimal pathing, automating object detection. Uh, we have a very strong partnership with the MAVEN program that we're very excited, has persisted through the many, many years. Um, and I think that with respect to like exactly uh, what types of use cases, it's really everything across the entire agency. It is the way we do analysis, the way that we do situational awareness, assessing risk, uh, being able to optimize like every workflow that is a part of our agency's mission. And so as we continue to advance these capabilities, we're always looking towards that future of how can we get there faster because time is of the essence and getting this right is essential. There is often, um, I guess our biggest risk is we don't get a second chance at many of the most important things that occur in our world. And with the weight of the responsibility of being part of this providing national security, um, we have to absolutely do this well. Great, we've, we've talked a little bit about the as is, now let's really focus on the future. And so I'll go ahead and start with you, Michelle. What do you think uh, the role of human analysts in the future in validating and interpreting AI-generated intelligence? Uh, that's an excellent question. So I would say that this is a really big challenge for us because as we look to the future, we should imagine a future where we have tens of thousands of models that are going to be operationalized across the entire battle space, um, as Captain uh, just mentioned earlier. And for us to be able to deploy those models effectively, like we have to have processes in place where we're ensuring that we're getting the best quality data, the volume of data, the variety of data that is necessary to inform and drive those models to be able to monitor those models in an ethical, legally compliant way, um, to operationalize them in a way that preserves the American values and democratic like systems that we hold so dear as American citizens. And so I think that in terms of the future, we need to not only look towards having the optimal technical solutions, but also the ethics and legal compliance government uh, governance uh, frameworks in order to deploy these models effectively aligned and consistent with our American values. John, how is uh, this human-machine collaboration uh, going at scale? It's constant work. 
um, to create exquisite training data sets is really a lot of work. If you think about uh, GPT, for example, if we stay in the natural language processing realm, but I think it's analogous also to what we face in geospatial, uh, these large language models were not good at doing math problems in the beginning. But in less than 12 months, GPT was retaught how to solve math problems. Now that involved humans coming together and writing down the 800,000 steps it takes to solve most math problems, and it scored an 89% on the next AP calculus exam, so in the top 20% of the country. So if you think about all the different information domains that we're gonna have to train computer vision and uh, language models in, that takes a lot of work to get those exquisite training data sets. And then once you have the model, thanks to entropy, it's always in decay. There's a maintenance component to it. For every edge case you haven't seen yet, for example, the self-driving cars in California have not seen a thunderstorm in St. Louis. They wouldn't survive you know, making those turns through the rain and hail here. So you have to keep training these models, and that will be, I think, a responsibility not only of the analysts in the organization, but also their chief data officers. Captain Yateman, earlier today we heard from uh, one of our keynotes about um, the warfighter integration with AI. Um, can you give some other examples of uh, human-machine collaboration and in integration into the future? Yeah, so I want to highlight a little bit about what my boss said today, the deluge of data, right? Um, so that deluge of data, right, is also uh, is created a deluge of thirst to use that data by our warfighters. And the ability to be able to make sure that our models are meeting those, those outputs and those demands is that pairing with our warfighter. Being able to be integrated with them, being able to be able to deliver, sit with them, work with them, take their feedback uh, to be able to deliver the capability is what's going to be critical. I think the, into the future, you're going to see warfighters asking questions about models that would have been, or about CVAI and ML, which would have been unthinkable like 10 years ago. They don't, they want to move past the idea of having a, a OV1 on a pretty PowerPoint. They're actually asking questions like, what are the F1 scores? What are that? That type of pairing and that type of feedback is going to be critical going forward. So I think that uh, in the future, uh, the reason why we brought maybe the NGA was to pair it with the geospatial intelligence analysts that we have there and that horsepower is only going to deliver a better uh, output here going into the future. So since we're thinking about the future and we're talking about how we're going to utilize AI, we also have to think about adversaries. So what are some challenges and risks associated with the increased use of AI, uh, especially geospatial AI, um, and are there specific risks that we should really be concerned with uh, for our adversaries or from our adversaries' use? So I think that's a chat GPT question. So I'm going <laughs> to do a little human machine teaming on this one and kind of turn that a little bit to talk a little bit about um, the key in that to be able to be able to trust, right? The trust, the, the piece of uh, CVI, AI, ML capabilities. I think one of the things that we've talked about today was ethical use, trust, and along the way. I think one of the other pieces that we need to touch on is resiliency. We're telling our warfighters that they're going to have to rely on AI and ML to give them the decision advantage. They need to know it's going to be there, right? Whether it's perfect conditions, imperfect conditions, um, you know, we have perfect conductivity, we have un imperfect conductivity. So I think as adversaries look to be able to target that, that, that sustained delivery of AI to the warfighter, we're going to have to look at ways to be able to ensure that that capability is being delivered throughout the continuum of conflict, not just at the high end of war, but in the day-to-day -day operations. So. John, what are, are some risks? Uh, speaking for myself only, um, so we heard about Moore's Law. We should also remember Wright's Law, which is for every order of magnitude increase in production, there's an order of magnitude reduction in cost and price. So the barriers to entry to GPUs are approaching zero meters, effectively. Um, and at this point, I mean, we have high school students using small UAVs uh, and college students using UAVs to look for methane by detecting changes in vegetation. One of the things that you hear the senior military leaders say is that we're going to operate in a contested environment in the future, which is something we've not done in a generation. Uh, we have also not assumed that we need to practice denial and deception in our programs within the United States because there is persistent capabilities of, of adversaries in the future. I, for one, hope for world peace. We do not want the kind of conflict that's out there looming in the future. Uh, we achieve it through deterrence, but we need to be eyes wide open about um, the accessibility of these capabilities globally now. 
Michelle, are there uh, things that are keeping uh, IC analysts uh, up at night in the field of AI and uh, national security? I would encourage everybody to think about the questions of what capabilities are our adversaries investing in and why? What are their values? What are their forcing functions? How are they applying these technologies and to what end? And why is that a risk to America potentially or our American values? And so I could provide a static response, but really I would encourage you all to be critical thinkers. Put yourselves in our shoes and imagine the future if the entire globe has democratized access to these tools and given what we know about the various nations in the world, what are they gonna do with them? That would keep me up at night. Yeah. Since we're here at St. Louis University um, and we have a lot of students in the room, I really think we should talk a little bit about education and workforce development. Uh, you are all in, in the intelligence community and um, working with AI. So can you tell us what sort of educational initiatives or partnerships are in place uh, to address the evolving demands of AI? And most importantly, what are those skill sets? What should students today who are out in the audience be studying if they wanna come and work uh, somewhere in the community uh, and work with AI? Sure, this is actually one of my favorite topics because before I was an intelligence officer, I was in academia myself. Um, and I really miss the university environment, even though I think that I have the best job in the world now. Um, but I have three children in college, and they are studying cybersecurity, computer science, and computational analytics and data science, respectively. So I'm very proud of them. But we have these conversations all the time. So with respect to skills first, um, yes, I'm very excited about all of the classes that they are taking and the content that we discuss, but when they ask me for advice about how do I make myself more competitive for any given job, I tell them, pursue individual excellence. Mm. Make yourself better every single day. Don't look behind you, don't look around you to compete. Compete against yourself. You know how to make yourself better. Getting a degree is where you start learning. So decide now that you are going to be a lifelong learner because our technologies are evolving at a pace that is ferocious. And being able to stay on top of your field when you're also advancing your career and trying to evolve all of the new trade crafts that you haven't even maybe considered yet is going to be incredibly challenging. And so you just need to decide now that you're willing to invest that time in yourself because you yourself are your absolute best investment. And then with respect to our partnerships, we have an ambassador program with universities all across the country. Uh, we are always actively recruiting, so we encourage students to please apply to our CIA.gov website. Um, we have internships in a myriad of fields. Our analytic methodologist career path is akin to our geospatial analyst. So, um, we're both great options, NGA and CIA. Uh, that said, uh, we look forward to talking to you, right? So if you see us at a recruitment event um, or even at AwesomeCon, which I was pleasantly surprised to know that we have a booth at, uh, we're at events all over the nation and we would be glad to discuss opportunities with you. John, what sort of uh, folks are uh, coming to work for you at Scale AI? Uh, really, everyone from entry level through uh, some of the PhDs with machine learning engineering. And my advice to students would be a couple of things. Um, take up some public service, and especially if you can use that as a path for getting your education. Uh, all the degrees I've pursued have been either fully or partially paid for by my employer. Uh, you commit your time to them, and they'll commit to your development. And then the second bit of advice I would give is don't be afraid to write a cover letter. Uh, half of my jobs have come through a cover letter and resume into people I've never met before. The other half were through networking. So have the courage to write the cover letter and, and reach for that opportunity. Captain Yeager, any well, advice for uh, budding analysts out there? 100%. Um, so my career, uh, I've served as a detailer for the naval intelligence community, bringing people in. I've worked with special operations folks, which I thought were the best of the best, and I never, ever would capture that energy that I, that I saw when I was serving with special operations. I walked into the MAVEN program 
and I see career geospatial analysts sitting next to brand new engineers. And it is infectious. I mean, I come to work excited every day to see how we can pair that, that we can pair the, the geospatial knowledge that's there with the energy of a, uh, engineers wanting to tackle that. So I would say that enthusiasm that you brought up, that, that being uh, superior, right, to, to, to seek excellence is gonna be key. But inside AI, it, there is no one size fits all, right? You can be a computer scientist, you can be a political scientist like myself, um, and you can make an impact inside those programs. I think um, you make your opportunities as you join programs, um, and, I, and I really am truly believing that, um, that we're on the cusp of the, the next greatest generation of folks contributing to this problem. So um, I literally love going down to go sit with those engineers every day and, uh, and, and having them tackle problems of which I have been struggling with for a 25 year career and having them solve it in about 15 minutes and look at me like I'm crazy, right? Like, <laughs> this isn't that hard. Why did it take this long to be able to solve it? So, um, so I have already did some recruiting tonight. We have an individual that both Michelle and I are now uh, exchanged uh, contact information with that's looking to join the, uh, the agency. And I think that's also one of those key things. Don't miss opportunities like this to network with folks that are inside the agencies, inside government, inside the industry. Uh, to be able to, to affect uh, your employment and participation in AI and ML. Great, and uh, I have a follow-up, and this is actually one of our uh, prepared questions, but also from the audience. Can you uh, discuss ways that the IC can collaborate? Uh, we've talked about academia, but with uh, industry partners as well as international partners to leverage uh, AI technologies effectively, and especially if you can give an example of where industry has partnered with um, the IC or the military in AI? So I would say um, we are, we live and die by the fact that we have our industry partnerships, right? The ability to be able to bring, bring the best of breed of things that are going on in industry and bring it into the Department of Defense or into the IC to be able to affect AI ML delivery. I think that that stovepipe, if we divorce that relationship, we are actually setting ourselves at a disadvantage. Um, I sit here with John. Uh, John and I know each other. We've worked in the past. I mean, the, the work that we do with some of our, with the, some of the folks out there, like Scale AI, is critical. They bring in great ideas, right? We bring in the use cases and the problems, right? Pairing those two together is what is going to continue to propel uh, the the DoD and IC's gains in AI and ML. So, John, can you give some examples of how you've worked with um, military and uh, IC? I'll highlight an opportunity for uh, academia and FFRDCs. So earlier today, we heard about the law of armed conflict. When you look at the ethical benchmark test for a large language model, it's a series of true-false tests. It only has three sentences related to death. And it's a very generic, the jury found me innocent or found me guilty. So if we're really gonna have benchmark tests that reflect the complexity of the arm, you know, laws of armed conflict, we need FFRDCs in academia probably writing those statements about how do we interpret this court martial or these you know, class of um, cases from past warfare. And if you think about everything, whether it's the AP calculus test or anything else you're trying to demonstrate that a computer vision model can do or a large language model can do, you have to have benchmark tests and we don't have enough. Well, the specific example that I would cite is my organization um, provides IC data science services uh, throughout our community, both our IC and DoD partners. And in pursuit of this, um, we have partnered with industry partners, um, both uh, cloud providers and our own internal uh, contractors to achieve something that I think is really revolutionary, right? Because the, the vision for this, and NGA was part of this origin story, uh, was to be able to accelerate sharing our AI models and co-associated data sets rapidly across the entire community and to reduce reuse, right, save taxpayer dollars, um, and to ensure that we have the kind of transparency so that we're doing peer review in near real time of all of our collective bodies of work. And so as a part of these um, IC data science services, we have an analytic compute environment, we have containerized 
AI model and data exchanges. We have code repositories and really like have the, the kind of um, accelerated capabilities to ensure that we are providing the best possible solutions throughout our community collectively. Great, as a follow on to that, I think you've all alluded to uh, the ethical use of AI, but let's dive into this ethical use of AI a little bit more. Um, we currently see um, governments around the world uh, starting to put up um, a legal framework, uh, ethical framework. The thing is, you know, politics takes time, and so, very few countries actually have those frameworks in place right now, and, but we are using AI today, and uh, apparently we've been using it for quite a while. So can you tell us that what, uh, what is uh, available today to ensure that decisions driven or influenced by AI align with those ethical standards? What are the ethical practices that are being used while we're waiting on um, larger scale ethical and legal uh, road, um, practices to emerge? Certainly. Well, um, I'm very fortunate that I came up through the agency uh, as a data scientist and as a geospatial analyst. Um, so there were, I think, the, the identification of this problem very, very early on at a grassroots level. And so we partnered very early with our privacy and civil liberties um, office and our internal attorneys to say, we want to make sure that when we're doing these types of things, that we're doing it in a legally compliant way, that we're doing it in a very ethical way. And so we partnered to develop an ethical AI framework um, that we use as part of like our process when we go to develop and deploy and operationalize our AI models. And so I think that that has been very effective and has taken root and we have promulgated our best practices throughout the community, sharing it with DNI and um, all of our other IC partners. And then I would also say another thing that has been pivotal is we just have a, a tremendous number of events throughout the year. So tomorrow, I'm, I'm on a plane back tonight because tomorrow we have an ethical AI conference. And this is something that we do annually. And it's just to remind everybody, right, that we have this framework um, to share some of our ethical AI challenges that we've had to really sort of like surface them for debate. And I've been a part of uh, those debates and, and really like one of the most exciting things to engage in is challenging ourselves about is this an ethical operation uh, to be able to deploy AI in this manner and, and going back and scrutinizing like the original trade craft as well as part of that um, analysis. And then I would say finally, right, like to always remind ourselves that the currency of trust with the American people is foundational to every single thing that we do. And so we just have to remind ourselves, like, can we be held accountable for our actions, right? Because at the end of the day, just like how we have to be accountable for every dollar that we spend, we have to make sure that we can hold our heads high and say that we did this in a consistent way with our American values. John, any more thoughts on ethics and the use of uh, AI? Yeah, definitely. So there are policies being written around the world. Uh, the People's Republic of China's policy for large language models has a clause that says it cannot be used to subvert the government. Now, in contrast to the United States, we've got the Bill of Rights, and we've got lots of jurisprudence about how the state can interact with our rights. Uh, and most of what is in the large language models are from English democracies. But we still have to have test and evaluation to confirm that we're reducing the harms in them. The good news is the government has been thinking about this for longer than we can imagine. Uh, the DOD's instruction on autonomy in weapon systems is more than a 10-year-old instruction. And they have uh, ethics offices and a variety of checks and balances on the use of power within the government, and that will be no, uh, no different with how we use AI and ML. I think the importance now is it's better to be right than to be first. Um, and for the government to go through the deliberative process we have with multiple branches of government deciding what's going to be right for our society with respect to these technologies. Captain Yateman, the warfighter's uh, use of ethics? Well, it's grounded in the law of armed conflict, right? You heard it today spoken from the director of NGA. Um, it is on the forefront of his mind and his forefront of his guidance that he gives to all of his AI and ML programs. So that Use, utilization, of a, utilization of a tool or a capability doesn't lift us of the responsibility to follow that, follow that guiding principle as a warfighter. So continue to use that as a basis of how we employ uh, you know, AI, ML, and CV 
to be able to meet DOD and IC requirements is going to be foundational to what we do going forward. There are other frameworks out there. The ODNI has a framework out there for ethical use of AI. We're steeped in that within our program. With NGA, it's going to be on the it's going to be on the cutting edge on ensuring that we're promulgating capabilities of pro in uh, in guardrails for ethical use of AI going forward. So, okay, we've talked about how AI, uh, the ethical considerations differ potentially uh, depending on certain countries' legal and ethical frameworks. How are we cooperating with our allies? Um, because we don't generally go to war alone. We go to war with our allies. Um, we have allies uh, all around the world. So how are we um, working with our allies to ensure that um, our AI uh, or use of AI is aligned? Does anyone have any examples or uh, ideas on what that should look like? I would say that our ally, I mean, our partners come to us all the time with some of the best practices within the GOINT community. AI is one of those areas that they want to collaborate more on. We want to be able to take those best practices of which they are doing, which they're utilizing to be able to support whatever operations out there, whatever warfighters are out there, pull that into our ecosphere and be able to do. The beauty of NGA is that it has an international component, just like, uh, just like our other partners here, and it presents that opportunity to bring those ideas in and collaborate on them. So we are actively partnering with some of the folks out there in the international sphere to be able to do that. And I think there's some great things to come in the future um, as we kind of mature the AIML work that's going on within NGA. Well, my most requested briefing from our allies is on workforce development. Um, because we face similar challenges in the space of competing with industry, especially industry salaries, uh, for the best talent. And so um, usually, like, I end up going and briefing on all of our attrition challenges or incentive programs, um, but really, at the end of the day, it comes down to mission. For some of us, <laughs> this is a genuine calling. And so when we find like-minded people who also believe that in their heart, Really, those are the people that, that I look to recruit. Great. I think since we've got about 10 minutes left, um, we've got some questions from the audience that I want to uh, put out to you. And if you have other questions, please, you've got a few minutes to get the questions in. Uh, this first one, I think, actually uh, is probably directed for uh, Captain Yateman. Um, and really, can you sp um, tell us, there's so many questions coming in now, it's uh, flooding my screen. How can AI engines and machine learning models assist warfighters in an environment where uh, a GPS denied environment just to ensure uh, capability isn't um, degraded? So can you give some examples of how we could use AI, AI to overcome um, GPS jamming and those sorts of? Well, I talked a little bit about that resiliency piece a little earlier. I mean, some of the capabilities that are within NGA, like our joint regional edge node work that we're doing out in, you know, in many of the areas are outside the United States, will ensure delivery of AIML capability in a denied environment. So um, what I don't want to do is hit that piece where we start to talk about how do we function in a denied environment, like we have having, you see this conversation going on with GPS now. I want to be able to do that on the forefront. But there are capabilities that NGA is do, utilizing in place in the greater enterprise that can ensure that continued delivery going forward. And I think that, that work is going to be critical to ensuring that the you know, combat commanders can rely on AIML throughout the continuum of conflict and day-to-day and, and -day operations. Okay. This next question um, I think is very interesting, and I'm going to uh, change it just a little, uh, but the question uh, asked if we could speculate on um, what does accountability look like uh, when an action is uh, either assisted by AI or made by AI if it goes wrong. For instance, we've heard earlier about hallucinations, and so um, where is the accountability chain uh, as far as AI is concerned? Because you can't say you were a bad AI, you know, or you're fired. Um, can we talk about uh, within a national security and especially a military setting, who's ultimately responsible? Well, we're always taught the commander is ultimately responsible for the tools in which they utilize. So I think that that, that human machine teaming piece that we have talked about throughout the day here is going to be critical to ensuring that that accountability re remains, um, you know, enduring, right? That trust 
that there is a human in the decision making of, of, uh, uh, of things that would entail taking someone's life or, you know, or doing you know, operations that could result in loss of life. Um, I think that's what's going to be critical. And I think I have not heard uh, anyone talking about removing that capability. I think the, the director here actually slammed, smacked the table today and said that we have to ensure that uh, you know, positive identification and that capability uh, to maintain the accountability throughout is, is going to remain um, a foundational aspect of any AIML program within NGA and within the department. Agreed. Uh, for all the leaders I speak with, they assume and require that a human is still in the loop. And if you think about when we fly, there's an autopilot uh, component of our flight, but the pilot and crew are still responsible for the aircraft. And if you're behind the wheel of a car using any sort of driver-assisted technology, you're still the driver, you're responsible. And I think we'll see that continue in, in every government use case for a long time to come. Michelle, uh, any examples we've already talked about? You know, I think this definitely falls into ethics. Uh, who's accountable uh, for AI decisions? And uh, what happens when a wrong uh, decision or a wrong outcome? Uh, you know, I can tell you, I, I think it's logical to assume that politicians are going to want to hold someone responsible and accountable. Uh, so what can we do now to prepare for that, uh, to increase that human-machine collaboration, but to ensure uh, the human is part of that? Absolutely. Well, I concur 100% uh, with what's been said. Ultimately, it is the responsibility of senior leadership. The responsibility really, it has to, to be akin to extreme ownership, right? But the foundation of the trust relationship between that commander or that senior leader and the entire like technical workflow has to be like rock solid, right? So we have to do everything that we can as data scientists and AI practitioners to ensure that we have test evaluation, validation, verification systems, that we have very, very tight MLOps pipelines, that we have the best possible data security and integrity, that data is arriving as quickly as possible so that we can inform our senior leadership and our commanders that they have our best effort. And at the end of the day, the greater the risks, the more humans must be in the loop. But those humans are making very, very difficult decisions based on whatever information that they have at hand. And it's not always every piece of possible information. There are still going to be unknown unknowns. And they still have to make that best possible decision. And the weight of those decisions rests very heavily on their shoulders. And we thank them for that. Okay, in our last five minutes, uh, before we uh, talk about which questions were potentially generated by AI and which ones uh, came from the audience and or uh, our team, uh, I want to give everyone a chance for kind of a closing comment, uh, and especially if we could direct it towards the students that are in the audience. Uh, you know, what, what was this uh, one message you would like students to leave here today with uh, concern about AI and uh, national security and what their role could be? Well, I think this is an incredibly exciting field. I love going to work every day, and I have just tremendously enjoyed my entire career. The people that I work with, I think, are the smartest people in the entire world. Um, but I just want to encourage like, the students today to like, be equally excited, right? Like, don't be daunted. Come in and, and like share your ideas and bring your, your unbridled enthusiasm to like every effort. And don't let people tell you no. I was told no a lot, and I just look at no as like, well, how do I drive to yes? So don't ever be discouraged, right? Like your ideas, even if they're not perfectly formed or perfectly articulated, they're evolving, right? So take pride in that. And, and then like, when you go out in the world, like try everything, try industry, try government, try academia, you know, like this is your whole life. Enjoy your job until you find your calling and then stick with it and give it your best. John? If I can rely on the internet research I did earlier today, I believe Gene Krantz is a graduate of St. Louis University. So distinguished alumni was part of the space program. 
Uh, that was one program for 12 years to get to the moon after President Kennedy said we choose to go to the moon. AI is not one program. AI is going to be available for everyone to work on. And as you've heard, our leaders face information deluge. Uh, they're overcome by the amount of information they have to process morally and ethically, and they need your help. So uh, commit to solving some problem for them. Have the courage to experiment. Have the courage to change careers. And just enjoy what you're doing with this. So I would say I'm, if I could do this all over again, I'm wrapping up you know, 20 some odd years of a career. I would want to get into this field, right? This is how exciting it is uh, to be a part of what I see happening every day. And I don't think there's a one size fits all or one journey to be able to contribute to this, right? To, to highlight that piece. You could be a uh, GON analyst, you can be an engineer, you could be a you know, professional naval intelligence officer and get into this field. But what I like about the opportunities going forward and is that ability to be able to spend time with industry, come into the government, go back out into industry, bring in those best ideas. Um, I just think that you can't pick a better field right now to be a part of. Um, it's just very, very exciting and it's enthusiastic. Uh, it's, it's infectious when you get to work around these people every day. Um, so I think the future is bright. I think that uh, this is the, the field of the future, so. Great, and now we've just got about two minutes left, but quickly, um, some of these questions, as I mentioned, were uh, generated by our team, and some were AI generated. And so you guessed right earlier, uh, as far as uh, the one question being, uh, does anyone else have any ideas on which questions may have been completely generated from a very simple prompt? Uh, there wasn't a lot of sophisticated prompt engineering, a very simple, uh, if a professor interviewed senior leaders of the IC on AI and national security, what are some questions that should be explored? And that was the only prompt that was entered. Any guesses for the other questions? Maybe the one about the future. Yes, Michelle, any uh, last uh, guess which uh, question? I wouldn't presume to guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're actually right. The human machine collaboration question uh, was uh, the future question. And then the uh, collaboration and partnership question was actually <laughs> verbatim um, computed by AI, and uh, I just copied and pasted it onto the little index card. All right, I want to thank you uh, all for uh, our wonderful panel today, and thanks again for everyone for the great questions. Third panel, which will focus on the next generation of geospatial practitioners. We need them. You heard that earlier today several times. Let me introduce you to Rhonda Schrenk, the moderator for this session. Rhonda is the Chief Executive Officer for the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation and leads the foundation in its mission to promote the geospatial intelligence tradecraft and develop a stronger geoint community. In this role, Rhonda sets the strategic direction for the foundation to effectively enable each aspect of mission accomplishment. Join me in welcoming Rhonda Schrenk. All right. Welcome back for lunch. This is the best time slot of the day, right? We considered doing a little bit of calisthenics to, to start our panel, some burpees. We were going to pump in some music. But you guys look like you're pretty awake. so. So we're going to go with that. Going to sit down and join my themed colleagues. <sighs> thank you to St. Louis University and thank you to NGA for hosting these important conversations. The entirety of the morning blew me away. And what that means is it's a little bit of a wild card, and I'm going to share that with you at the same time as the panel as to what I'm going to say because I was so excited about the conversation, so we might evolve a little bit. Don't be afraid about what we're going to talk about today. So a little bit about me. I grew up in the state of Maryland, and I always wanted to work for the federal government because that's what we do in the, in the D.C. area. And I learned languages. I did not do drugs because I wanted to have a clearance one day. Yeah, yeah. No drugs. 
And I was interested in other cultures. I thought I was going to be a signator. Well, that didn't happen. Thankfully, I was recruited by one of the press predecessors to NGA and became a geointer. When I was hired, I was recruited, and they said, we can't tell you what it's for. I was like, what? How do I prepare for that? You'll be fine. I became an imagery analyst, and as an imagery analyst back then, just a few years ago, you learned your craft and you became an expert at it. And it was the same, the same, the same, and you got better, better, better. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case today, and you know that, right? We heard that this morning. So today we're gonna talk about our tradecraft and what really drives that tradecraft, the humans, and how we spark some excitement to all of you that are in the, the geospatial tradecraft or are thinking about it. All right, so let me introduce our panelists and what I would like you all to do um, one by one, um, and Kair, we're gonna start with you, is to give us a little intro. Tell us what you do today, beyond the title, like really what you do today, and what got you interested in this community? So proper introduction, Kair Bonsas Bonsasa. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Kair Bonsasa. Um, it's from Congolese descent, and I'm a graduate research assistant here at St. Louis University. I work in a remote sensing lab by St. Louis University, and it is advised by Dr. Sagan. And I conduct research. I am using ground penetrating radar to assess the feasibility to phenotype crops. I graduated with a political science degree um, from Harris Doe State University just about two years ago, one year ago. But uh, now what got me into geospatial was the introduction to GIS at Harris Doe State University. I'm very thankful to my alma mater. Uh, we were able to tie geospatial into social sciences. We were assessing the correlation between tree canopy and educational attainment and household income in different areas of the St. Louis city. And we contrasted that with the county of St. Louis. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> All right, next up, um, not a stranger to the USGIF, um, SLU NGA stage, Marley Mallet. Marley. Hi, yes, my name's Marley. I am recently graduated from the University of Missouri in St. Louis, or UMSL. I graduated with a degree in astrophysics and I recently started my career at NGA, or the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and I am a geodetic earth scientist in the Office of Geomatics there. So I um, would kind of say I didn't necessarily find the geospatial world, the geospatial world kind of found me um, through some mentors that are very dear to me, and um, specifically one NGA mentor and um, my academic advisor um, formulated a plan to bring some unclassified research um, to UMSL where I wouldn't have to get a security clearance. And so during my undergrad, I actually performed some unclassified research on a project called the AI Gravity Project where we predict gravity anomalies um, using artificial intelligence and machine learning um, for areas in the world where we cannot collect the data. And I worked on that for two years through a CRADA agreement and then moved on to applying to an internship at NGA, which was encouraged by my mentors. And then that led into a full-time position last December. So that is where I am right now. All right, two, two very different paths. <laughs> Next up, Ashley Poling. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ashley Poling. Um, right now, I am the Quality Assurance Manager at a local uh, geospatial solutions company called T-Card USA. Um, I really got my start in geospatial not knowing at the time, um, but growing up, I was very into weather, and I would you know, kind of mimic my weatherman, my local weatherman, you know, pointing to the directions of the cold front in front of the TV. Um, so that kind of created that first kind of geospatial awareness of where you are in relation to uh, your location. 
Um, so I graduated in 2008 from Valparaiso University with a degree in geoscience, kind of incorporating you know, the, the meteorology, geography, geology aspects of, of the earth sciences. Um, shortly after graduation, I got a job at a small mathing company in Middle Tennessee. I spent eight years there, got a really good depth of knowledge there. Um, now I was at a point in my life where I wanted to be closer to family because I was I'm born and raised in the Midwest. So I moved back, I moved not back to St. Louis, I'm from Indiana. So I moved to St. Louis to be closer to family. Um, and for the past seven years, I've been with T Card USA. Um, and starting as a geospatial analyst, moving my way up to uh, quality assurance. Um, we, we've spent a lot of time in the actual raw data for, in, in support of NGA. Fantastic, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> All right, um, last but definitely not least, my, my longtime friend and colleague, Theata Williams. Good afternoon. Um, I have a little bit of a different story uh, getting started in this uh, profession. I actually, about almost 28, 29 years ago, coming out of college, uh, I was a social sciences major, English major, actually, uh, liberal arts, and um, I really did not know what I wanted to do, except I knew I needed to get a job. And so I came across a job with big DOD through the Department of Navy Civilian Personnel Management, um, starting off at an entry level. I still didn't know what I wanted to do, but I made the best of it. And it was through mentoring and networking and putting my best foot forward that um, one of my mentors recommended me to then the director of HR at the Defense Mapping Agency, which no longer exists but is a precursor of one of eight that made up the National Imagery and Mapping Agency and is now the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, through a variety of assignments, I came to grow, learn, and love human resources. And as a result, um, when I had my first interview with the DMA director, Betty Welch, then she said, what's your goal in the future? And I said, I want to be you. I want to be the director of HR. And I said that just to impress her so I could get the job. <laughs> um, but lo and behold, two years ago, I was selected to be the director of human development for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and I currently serve in that role. Um, and it is absolutely phenomenal. It is a great job to have because I am looking at, hopefully, NGA's future and that I will see many of uh, interested applications coming our way to be a part of the NGA family and grow and learn in your respective careers. So I appreciate uh, the time today, Rhonda, to be able to talk with my esteemed colleagues about what it means to work in this world, in this geospatial world. All right. <laughs> So I saw a couple of different themes, and yeah, I told you my Maryland story. I know we're, we're not in Maryland on purpose, because this is a geospatial town here. And I hope that people younger than any of us, right, because we're all young, at least at heart, um, in this area are growing up dreaming geospatial, right? Thinking about how they want to be a part of this community, how they can network, how they can get an internship, and not sort of fall into it. I definitely fell into it, um, and, I, and I thank my lucky stars. So now we're gonna start on the opposite side. Be thinking of your questions. Please use the app to um, let us know what you're curious about. Meanwhile, I'm gonna continue to help you to get to know our panel. So Vieta, I'm gonna come back to you. We've got a lot of students here in the audience. What, do you, what is your thought on the future of geospatial work? And can you talk to us about, from an HR perspective, hiring trends, what's coming down the pipe? Sure. I would say, in a nutshell, where the geospatial careers are concerned, the world is your oyster. It is a growing trend and has been for several years and has an annual growth uh, throughout public and private sector of 19%. Uh, 
Um, you can't really go to any company without them seeking after some type of GIS skill, ability to be able to understand the earth, understand where people are, and, and also coupled with that, understanding some of the automated tools and sciences that would just augment opportunity to be able to understand the world. Um, and so, you know, if in terms of that, I think it's important that you remember that not only in the government are we looking for talent as such. At NGA, we hired nearly 650 uh, individuals um, this year alone for fiscal year 2023. That's one of the highest uh, rates that we have had over the last four years. Um, and what's also important is, is that for NGA, we typically and traditionally have hired from diverse educational and professional backgrounds. Uh, we have an accredited college uh, that we take in entry level uh, analysts to come in if it would if you're applying to be an imagery analyst or a geospatial analyst we have the 12 to 16 week mandatory course where we, we we will teach you about being an analyst we've hired people like english majors history majors geography majors and then not to mention some of the harder sciences as well um, some of the trends that go with that is that we have to be a lot faster when it comes to uh, geospatial intelligence. We have to leverage automation um, more so now than ever and even more in the future. Because with big data and then with such fluidity happening around the Earth in terms of understanding where people are, understanding location, etc., we need automation to help su support that. And so having a, com a combination of tradecraft experience as well as some data literacy level of experience, data management, science, uh, stewardship, et cetera, is really a sweet spot, but it's not the end all be all. Don't discount yourself with that. There are plenty of um, certification courses, trainings that are out there that one could pick up to be able to be competitive for working in the geospatial analytic world. So um, I would say the trend is a good trend, uh, not just in public sector, but private. And we are certainly um, ready and prompt and willing to receive you in terms of your applications. You see the trend that I'm doing here? You see what I keep continue to repeat <laughs> in terms of uh, coming to NGA? We'd love to have you. All right. Yes, I agree. It's, it's an amazing community. All right. Ashley, for you, this morning we've heard the term geospatial IA, AI, I was an IA, AI, over and over and over again. Um, and we had a chance to talk last week, so I want to share what you thought, and, and it's maybe evolved from um, hearing this morning. How can artificial intelligence be incorporated into business, into our geospatial industry today? And how can it help you get your job done? Um, two things, efficiency and quality. Um, you know, I, I have 15 years in, in raw data, manually collecting, updating, manipulating all this data. And as you do this, you know, repetitive motion, you think of ways to automate your processes. Um, not only to save time for production on the front end, but also to have more time for quality at the back end. And I see AI as something similar. Um, you're getting this, this data to fill in you know, gaps or um, incorporating more data into your data sets. If you save more uh, time in your pr front end production, you can make sure that the data that you're getting fits and that it fits correctly. Excellent. All right, Molly, Marley. Remind us what your degree, your degrees are in? Uh, astrophysics, technically physics with an emphasis in astrophysics. Okay, so there, some people say hard STEM sciences. I say really hard STEM sciences. So tell us your thoughts about how hard STEM sciences contribute to geospatial and how we can win the hearts and minds of others like you in the hard STEM sciences to be a part of our geospatial community? 
Yeah, I really like this question because it is my flavor of geospatial, as I will call it. Um, I work in the foundational sides, and what does that mean? To me, it means the, you know, the ground truth products, the ones that are, you know, your gravity models, your terrain models, your flood mapping models, your base products that um, NGA is one puts out and can go into our navigational systems. Um, these very foundational products are very necessary to the geospatial um, analysis and, and routes that come farther down the line. And I don't think that it's as knowledgeable that those hard sciences are needed in the geospatial world. Um, again, it was not on my radar. It was only found through the networking and the connections that I found for my specific degree set. Um, I didn't know I could be an asset, especially not to an asset necessarily to national security. Um, you know of NASA. Everyone knows of NASA. It's easy to talk about space. Space is cool. But I think what um, students and kids even nowadays don't realize is how much still has to be done here. How much has to be done to ensure safety of navigation and just to um, ensure climate change effects and really address all those large national security issues. And it's important to get the message out there to students of hard sciences that you are valued and you are needed in this realm. Um, and one way I think we can do that is through collaborations with academia, it's through outreach all the way from the K through 12 level. It's um, specifically, I work on a project called the Geosciences and AI Application Lab, or Gaia Lab for short. So I mentor students um, like myself we give them unclassified um, projects to work on from local universities. Um, right now it's UMSL and it's moving to SLU and Harris Stowe as well. And we mentor them and guide their research. Well, what is all this doing? It's showing them a field um, that is, we specifically take physics and mathematics and computer science. So it's showing them a field and how their research um, could apply to NGA and it's giving them those skills, they're going home and talking about it, the community is talking about it, they have a poster here today um, from the Geo Hackathon for Humanity from down in um, St. Louis at T-Rex, and it's slowly trickling the conversation that those STEM degrees are needed um, in the realm of geospatial sciences. And I think through efforts like that um, are how we can really engage the future generation to let them know that we're there and they're needed Wow, okay, as always, you, you blow me away. Kair, you're, you're the, the newest of this panel to the, the geospatial community. Mm -hmm. um, still looking forward to your first full-time geospatial mm -hmm. opportunity. What are some of the things that most interest you um, in regards to the, the geospatial community and the impact that you are surely gonna bring? Mm -hmm. Some of the things that most interest me in the field of geospatial is the technology that surrounds it. I think the technology is rapidly improving. And ever since I was an undergraduate student, and even before then, I was always interested in computers. I wanted to help um, automate all of my tasks. I wanted computers to download all the data I wanted, whether it was from YouTube or anything else. And now I'm starting to see artificial intelligence emerge in the geospatial sector as well as everything else. I'm also interested in cloud computing that will be here hopefully less than 10 years from now. And I think its ability to rapidly automate tasks that would take a human years or sometimes decades to do is really integral. Um, as a political science major, some people always question, why am I in geospatial? Are they even related? Geospatial seems so STEM-based. And I feel that technology is in everything. It goes to social sciences, physical sciences, and every other study, and it's important to learn how. I think we're always focused on the why, but the how is how you actually measure the timeliness of whether a task is getting done. So geospatial was a means of how. 
to solve issues that are relating to social sciences. And I got an opportunity at Harrisdo State University to experience geospatial happening. So I'm definitely not an expert in all that geospatial has, but I'm thrilled to learn more about it. Well, I am thrilled that you are a part of our community. Yes, give them applause, yes. <laughs> All right, so now moderator's choice. I'm gonna meander a little bit. I see some questions coming in from the audience. Um, I, I am, and, and I still have some curiosity, so we'll, we'll, we'll pop back and forth. Um, the youngest certified GeoInt analyst um, in US history is here in the audience today. Is that, is that Trey? Raise your hand. Ah, congratulations. Very, very uh, important to know. Thank you. I'm not the youngest answer. Ah. Savannah, where are you? All right. Savannah, congratulations. And then, um, and, and our colleague um, Scott D'Augustine gave us a question asking, what are some of the certifications? Vieta, I heard, I heard you talk a little bit about certifications. So what are the certifications required or desired to work in the geospatial community? Do you need them to apply to get in the door? There are about, there are hundreds of certifications that are out there. If you look online, they have GIS certifications, they have uh, image science certifications, they have the world's your oyster, as I'll say again in terms of um, certifications, especially with data sciences as well, which you can't go wrong uh, with that if you're wanting to enter into this field. Uh, too numerous to name uh, accordingly, but I will say that even NGA had a, has a certification program. Uh, we have a geospatial uh, professional certification program for fundamentals as well as for more advanced as well. And so if you were to come on with um, NGA, uh, then you could apply to uh, take those courses, relevant courses and testing and have uh, be certified through NGA. Um, there are a number of uh, certifications, both uh, hosted by private sector organizations as well as in the public domain, but uh, I would encourage you to research those um, to see what's the best fit. Awesome. Ashley, another audience question. What advice would you give an older student who wants to work in the geospatial industry, but their background is from another field? Ask questions. Um, there's no stupid questions. Um, the, the more you ask, the more you learn. And Yeah, anybody wanna pile on on that? Any thoughts, Vieta? Yeah, I would say that, you know, basically, if you like solving hard problems, if you like challenging situations that, um, that you want to apply um, your critical thinking skills to, you like doing puzzles <laughs> um, that are really for advanced and, I, and having fun doing them, think about that. Uh, because those critical thinking skills is what's, real, it's what's needed. And so um, it's not always a linear direction in terms of edu educational courses, et cetera, but what makes you tick? What brings the best out of you uh, that could be applied to working in the geospatial world uh, that we could leverage in terms of um, working in this profession? So think about that as well. All right, Marley. So your generation, this new, this younger generation, uh, the digital natives, you've, you've been raised where you're immersed in technology all the time. So of course you're gonna come into the workplace with a jump, or I opine that you would come in with a jump on technical skills. And that's not all that you, that you bring. What are some of the possible overlooked talent, skills, or traits that your generation brings to the workplace? That's an interesting question. Um, I think now you said it's not about the technical skills, but if you really want to talk about my generation, and I don't want to generalize for everybody, this is maybe more of a my opinion and young professionals, what I can see them bringing to an office setting um, or this workforce. But 
I think our technical background has allowed us to be very adaptable, very okay with change, um, whether that was from you know the newest iPhone coming out, the newest app download, the newest game update. Um, you know we are continually learning and evolving with that technology, and I think that transfers to all aspects of our skills and our values as well. I think it's um, thinking of our generation as maybe we don't focus on job security, maybe we focus on job mobility. It's the idea that as automation and AI and machine learning and these techniques come in, we help develop those, and then maybe if it can take away some of the you know very monotonous button pushing jobs, don't think of it as taking that away. Think of it as, okay, what now do I spend my time on? What harder problem can I use my, my thinking skills for, my problem solving skills, um, my well-rounded skills as an individual? Where can I benefit my job or my role now? And I think that flexibility is very valuable and I think can alleviate a little bit of the scare behind possibly not having that very specific job role of task every single day being there forever. Um, I think that is definitely one of the most valuable things that we could bring to the workforce. I agree. Kair, so we'll stay with the digital natives. Yes, you, you, you come very well prepared technologically. Tell us, if, if you can, what are some areas that, that your peers, right, your, your graduate student, PhD student, peers still need to develop and or what are some areas that, that your mentors, I, I see one here in the, the front row, hey Fawcett, um, can help to, what are those skill sets that, that you still would like help with to build? So, and I remember thinking about this question, um, technical skills in the geospatial sector um, it's really hard to standardize for all people because geospatial is everything. I see that all the time. I've seen it on these screens. And I notice geospatial can entail artificial intelligence. It can entail um, GIS strictly. It can entail remote sensing. And trying to standardize one skill for my generation to develop in to accommodate the geospatial sector is hard. But personally speaking, I think the important skill to focus on is passion. And passion, I say that because it is not always natural. You cannot be passionate about something you haven't seen. And it's, it's interesting that I say that because I fell in love with remote sensing before I knew what it was. Mm. I've had a desire to see what is invisible to the naked eye. Remote sensing can be satellites taking images of areas where we cannot go physically. It can be taking pictures of plants and seeing the creases inside of plants with high spatial resolution. It can be seen underground with ground penetrating radar. But how can I be passionate about something I've never heard of? So I think it's important that we have a general ambition to want to go into a field and then be open to learning about different things that will exist when you enter it. So entering the remote sensing lab, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had nothing, no knowledge about GPR, but I knew that I was interested in seeing what you cannot see and I was able to continue and grow on the different technical skills that come with programming and other stuff um, as I continue to practice. So I think we just have to have more passion. Yes, thank you. Very well done. All right, um, Ashley and Vieta, I'd, I'd like you to consider this um, a little bit um, my curiosity about the job front and, and how you feel about the job front with the incorporation of artificial intelligence. Um, and also, a similar from the audience, um, how will deep learning and artificial intelligence 
um, how will it change what kind of geospatial jobs are available going forward? So either of you that wants to take a first stab. Um, I can go more into like the, the technical aspect of it. Um, I can see there being a shift from standard production to more of a quality control component of AI. Um, you, it's been a common theme today. You need that human element to help train these machines to know what they're looking at. Um, and with, the, with industry, you have this wealth of knowledge to help uh, keeping, keeping, those, um, keeping that feedback going to really enhance these models. Um, and as far as jobs, I, I, I was skeptical at first when AI started becoming, thinking, becoming a thing, like, I, I don't want machines to take my job. But it's, it's just going to be a transition, um, not only to help the quality of the model, but also the quality of the data that you get from the model. Um, you know, you still need to, to look at the, at the data and see how you're going to incorporate it in, into your workflow. Um, one analogy I have is meteorology. Uh, weather models have gotten so advanced, but they're not taking it away your, your forecaster's job. They still in, in, ingest that data um, and use their analysis, their, their analysis to create your forecasts. So I think that's kind of like a tangent in how we can use that in, um, to, to maintain jobs for incorporating AI into the geospatial realm. I don't think I can add to a more perfect answer. I think that you know there are some jobs that will exist that we don't have names for yet. It doesn't mean that uh, the jobs that are in place today can't be uh, augmented through the automotive uh, uh, advancements to allow the individuals that do that job to be able to do more of what's connected and needed from the human side that um, otherwise a computer could do on its own that we do today. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of, um, I'm sure there are going to be certain functions of jobs that we will no longer have to do because of the you know, AI and ML advancements that will be applied in geospatial um, but I think it's a, a matter of, you know, taking, like Ashley, I'm sorry, Ashley said, is to being able to look at jobs differently and being able to um, apply that which only the human can apply to those jobs and the oversight and the interpretation that a computer cannot do uh, to be able to um, have the total, the, the solution or answer uh, that's being looked for. I, I wanted to go back to something that was said earlier about passion, I loved your answer. Um, and what I thought of was, uh, for those individuals, I think it came to Ashley, the question um, in terms of individuals that are not in the geospatial world and um, you know, wanting to come forward. Um, there's an old adage I use, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out the boat, <laughs> right? Um, and what do I mean by that? Sometimes we look at things that we are unfamiliar with. Uh, and we might be a little nervous about it. You know, I'm in the middle of my career, or maybe I don't have a passion for that yet, but I know I need to learn these other areas. Take a chance, take those courses, take those certification courses. You don't know what you don't know unless you try. And so that's what I mean by if you want to walk on water, you got to get out that boat. Just take that step forward. There are plenty of tools that are out there that can help you to determine if that's the path you want to navigate on. Thank you. I agree so much um, with the passion. Thank you for circling back. Um, so, Vieta, we can't help but notice that NGA has a, a shiny new building um, yeah. under construction not far from here. Um, will there be additional hiring to, to fill out that building that, that you can talk about? And, and, and are you casting a, a wider net um, to have a um, different footprint here um, in the St. Louis region than you've had in the past. Yes, um, so thanks for that, Rhonda. So uh, we are very excited about uh, NTW and the new building that's being built out and will be complete in 2026. Uh, we're still operational in St. Louis. Uh, we're still down on 2nd Street, and we have um, a location at Arnold. So we are taking those applications now, but. Um, we are hiring for those individuals that are traditionally what are we doing today as well as those other um, uh, technological advanced areas as well, STEM areas. As I stated, um, we have 
over 650 hires this year, 40% of those were for STEM backgrounds. So as you can see, we have a multi multidisciplinary teams that we try to stand up in geospatial with a variety of skill sets that are gonna be needed um, from a variety of backgrounds. So don't count yourself out with regard to that. One of the things that we did do in terms of our K through 20 effort is that we initiated a high school internship program this year. Um, so we have, we have enjoyed having a robust college internship program where we are uh, uh, having applications on an annual basis for summer internships uh, for sophomore through senior. And with that, you could apply for a uh, scholarship as well where your tuition could be paying a monthly stipend as well, um, up to $25,000 a year. Um, and so that's for, our, uh, for those scholarships uh, that we have in place that we've gotten started. We had 11 selectees last year. For our high school intern program, we were able to recruit 38 students uh, this year, both uh, about 12 from the St. Louis area and the rest from the Washington Capital Region, getting them started on projects that are familiar with geospatial intelligence, and, so, and then also helping faculty to understand uh, the careers that exist within uh, NGA and other geospatial fora as well. Um, so we're excited about that. Now, some of the things that you might think about in terms of government service, it takes too long to get into government, right? That's some of you might be thinking about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we have done at NGA and we've been doing for the last year and a half is we've been trying to reduce our timeline uh, for application to um, uh, EOD, entry on duty date. Uh, we had an average about, of about a little, two days less than a year during that time frame that it would take for somebody to get hired with us. We are now a little over six months. We are, it takes about on average a median of about 192 days. Now you might think that's still a long time, but it is huge progress for us. Um, and so we have made a lot of efforts in making sure we um, find more efficiencies, working with the applicants so that you can have a great journey trying to uh, applying for us and getting on board with us and reducing that timeline because we know that we have a lot of competitors that can do it faster, but we also have a lot of benefits in working for NGA as well, which we're showcase showcasing like not only our scholarship programs, but also for some of the flexible programs existing within NGA as well for all to enjoy. All right. All right, now we're gonna do a speed round. So in 30 seconds, and we're gonna start here, but I'm gonna give you a chance to breathe before we go. Tell me, we're gonna do the opposite of what Dr. Alame did this morning. Instead of what keeps you up at night, what like really jazzes you up? What drives your passion? What are you so excited about that's happening, that's about to happen, that has happened in the geospatial community? So I'll start. For me, it's, it's getting to interact with colleagues like this, colleagues that have um, been through the trenches with me, Vieta, over three decades, yes, <laughs> to, to meet Ashley, Marley, Kair. I mean, this will be a moment, a, an hour that, that I always remember because you inspire me and you make me feel good about what we're doing to make this world an even better place. All right, was that enough time? Yeah. Okay, Kair. So in 30 seconds, I would say collaboration, um, being able to see different faces and have a very inviting community always helps me to be motivated. I have really good remote sensing lab members. They're very kind, some of them are here today and they're very motivating and they're supportive. So I think that's extremely important in order to have ambition to go into your lab and want to succeed in whatever you're trying to accomplish. Um, yeah. Mine was actually also going to be collaboration, specifically because of um, you know, the IC and geospatial and academia all coming together and solving these hard problems. Um, not alone, but you know, being more open about it, sharing the science. Um, a lot of the use cases of 
the geospatial or geoint community can be classified, but the science is not. We need to remember that um, you need computer scientists, you need mathematicians, you need the analysis, you need everyone able to come together in a comfortable environment, and I really believe that uh, we, are, we are going that direction. I feel like it has changed from the stories I've heard, um, and I think that will be very interesting to see in the future and to hopefully get to continue to mentor students and be a part of that. That's what I'm excited for. Um, I kind of have two directions I can go with this. Um, I, I really like diving into more of the, the, the technical aspects of geospatial. Um, how can I solve this problem? How can I solve that one? Um, but also knowing that I make a difference in, in my data. Um, the end users can vary, you know, from agriculture to defense. And knowing that uh, our knowledge is going into that to help that end user, the end mission, I think that's probably one of the highlights of my job. Awesome. I have two words, uh, generational diversity. I am excited about, right now, NGA has five generations represented inside of its agency. And if we do this correctly, we will learn from one another and the sky is the limit in terms of what we can accomplish. It goes back to what was said in the beginning, collaboration, and also humility in terms of the fact that someone else knows something more than the other, but that's okay because we can teach and learn from one another. And because the world is so dynamic right now, the demand upon uh, national intelligence as well as um, security for all of us and our, and our families and our allies around the world, we cannot do it alone. That's at an individual level and it's at an agency level. And so in order for that to happen, for us to be successful, we have to bridge the gap and understand and learn from one another, uh, ask more questions as was said earlier, and so that we can be uh, in the spirit of that collaboration and leadership for all the world to see to make it a better place. So I'm very excited about that. All right, thank you to all of you. You've been a wonderful and engaging audience, and let's give our panel a big round of applause. So now it's time for me to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, who is Anne Hale Milleracy. Now see, I was just sitting with Anne, and I said, is this how you pronounce your last name? And I got it right. And I, she said, yes, and I just fluffed it a little bit. So I'll say it again. Milleracy, Anne Hale Milleracy. And Anne is the founder of Radiant Earth Foundation and was its inaugural CEO. Radiant Earth Foundation is a nonprofit working to aggregate the world's open earth imagery and providing access and education on its use to the global development community. Prior to launching Radiant Earth, Anne served as president and CEO of Fogro Earth Data, as president and CEO of Planet IQ, and a principal director at Booz Allen Hamilton. In addition, she worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Coastal Services Center, where she directed remote sensing and GIS programs for over a decade, and was the first chair of the National Geospatial Advisory Committee. Please welcome Anne Hale Milleracy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to uh, be here with you. If I could have my slide deck. Maybe, maybe not. Nope. There we go. Okay. First, before I start, I want to say it's fascinating what this city has accomplished in partnership with NGA and with this university and with the other universities. I was first here in St. Louis in 2005. At that time, I was the CEO of Earth Data, now known as Fuguro Earth Data. And we had a large contract with NGA for, from the source directorate. Um, and every time I have come back to St. Louis, it has been in some part or another, 
because of the NGA mis mission, whether it's the couple of GEOINTS that I've been here or here today, or other uh, customer calls. And I know now that many of the geospatial commercial companies in the region have offices here. I can't imagine a forum like this happening anywhere else in the country. So to all of those who did this economic workforce development project here in St. Louis, my hat's off to you. You've been very successful. Um, my talk today is the past, the present, and the future, and how to innovate to evolve. Uh, that's me. Uh, that picture on the slide deck, which is, is up there, uh, is me 23 years ago doing my graduate research in the Savannah River Swamp System below um, nuclear production re reactors run by the Department of Energy um, in a Cypress Tupelo swamp. Um, so I've been in this business for a long time. My passion has always been the environment. I would have never dreamt that my career would have taken so many turns, uh, but it has been an excellent career. So. In the remarks that I've developed, I, I primarily am, am focused at the students in the room, but hopefully some of the geospatial professionals as well will enjoy it. I, uh, I am a geographer, um, undergraduate and graduate degree. I spent 14 years in state government for the state of South Carolina, the Department of Natural Resources, the Wa uh, Wildlife Department, the Water Resources Commission, and I spent time at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, working for the National Ocean Service. I spent 20 years working in the private sector. I've been the CEO of three commercial companies and the founder and CEO of a nonprofit and was a principal director for Booz Allen Hamilton. And I spent the last five years uh, with the Radiant Earth Foundation. And that's kind of a, a unique um, profile. Um, someone who has seen uh, our business evolve our passion, our profession evolve over these many years, and it's given me a great perspective. I love public speaking, all right? I've done an awful lot of it, but I have really struggled with this speech because previously I've always had one mission, one technology, one customer to talk about. And as I reflect, now that I'm, I'm really only working part-time, now I have a small personal consulting firm, what is it that I want to say to such a, a diverse room? I thought it was worth taking a, a walk past many of the technologies that have gotten us here today. And to really think about how those technologies have evolved uh, to create the ecosystem. I've had the good fortune of being involved early on in the development of digital imagery, uh, air, airborne LIDAR, as you'll see, IFSAR, radar, drone technology, GPS radio occultation data, clouds, and machine learning on Earth observations. So I want to review some of the fundamental, these fundamental technologies, and how they came to be, who invented them, how long ago they got invented, what they have in common, and how they've now been mainstreamed into our everyday life. First, though, we have to understand this, and I'm, I'm assuming most of you have seen this slide before. It holds very true um, time after time and again, and that is the technology adoption cycle, right? The initiator. In our business, the initiator is almost always the Department of Defense, and you'll see that. In, uh, in the examples I show in a few minutes. The innovators are often in the national labs. We heard about one of them earlier today. Oak Ridge National Lab is a wickedly, technically great organization. Um, people at NASA, people at NSF, um, uh, working in concert with private industry. The early adopters, then we start to see the commercial sector move in and bring resources to bear and think about new applications. And then, and then a technology gets mainstreamed and starts to grow. It catches on or it dies. Um, and the time scale, the x-axis here, has varied not very much at all with geospatial technology. I'd say there's one exception that's going to change that. 
Um, I am an optimist. I am a dreamer. Um, I'm a glass mostly full kind of girl. Um, and I almost exclusively work on the left-hand side of that slide. Um, because once an organization gets more mature, I'm, I'm ready kind of to move on and look for a new opportunity. So let's look at the first technology, LIDAR, light detection and ranging. It was first developed in the 1960s, and it was developed by NOAA, NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It was developed to map clouds, but it was developed with the Department of Defense's money. Why? The Department of Defense to this day is still very interested in every cloud that is over the surface of the Earth because many of our sensors can't see through those clouds. Now, with the proliferation of SAR, that's changed a lot. But 1960s, right? In 1971, NASA took a LIDAR instrument and put it on the Apollo 15 mission, not only to find the landing spot for the Apollo 15, but every Apollo mission from then on had a LIDAR on board so that they could begin to map the surface of the moon. I had my first opportunity to work with LIDAR in the 1990s, and it was an NSF, NASA, NOAA project to map the Greenland ice sheet um, some 30 years ago. We thought it might be melting. Gosh, we were right. Um, and um, to map the ice sheet to measure the glacial melt on the sheet, its balance, its flow, and its response to climate change. So look at that. DOD funding, right? And 60 years it's taken. Here's the size of the LIDAR market today. Today, LIDAR technology is used extensively in topographic and bathymetric mapping. Um, but it is expanding rapidly in self-driving cars, robotics, and data to create the digital twins. The global market for it is $11.6 billion in 2032. It took 60 years to get to this market value. And, and again, it was funded originally by DOD. Um, and it's funny, I used both ChatGPT and BARD uh, to research the facts, to make sure I didn't get them wrong. Um, and I prefer BARD, but BARD, I, I couldn't believe at the very end, said LIDAR market is still in its early stages of growth. It's hard to believe we're 60 years in. So Earth observation satellites, similar case. The first EO satellite uh, was the Vanguard 2. It had a, a camera on board, a video camera on board. Um, and it was a cloud cover sensor. It was funded by the DOD. It transmitted the very first images of the Earth to, from space back home. It only, however, worked for 20 minutes. But it was considered a, a great success, and um, shortly thereafter, about nine months later, Tyros-1 was launched in the spring of 1960. Again, funded by the DOD, weather satellite primarily focused on clouds. Uh, today, governments around the world operate weather satellites. There are approximately 25 weather satellites on orbit and imagery satellites um, that are more or less not entirely open source government satellites. Clearly, um, the intelligence agencies of governments around the world operate additional satellites that aren't in those numbers. But the fastest growing part of the market uh, for Earth observation satellites is driven by the commercial sector. The first funding, again, came from the government. It matured a little. The commercial sector has taken over. In 1959, um, since 1959, 8,200 satellites, Earth observation satellites, have been launched. And um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, which keeps a daily track of this, estimates that there are 3,300 still operating on orbit today. So again, 64 years of innovation, of discovery, of developing a market. Um, and I'll never forget, um, I, uh, I developed this slide in 20, I said 2018, 
when I was with Radiant full time to really communicate to the global development community in the global south. Um, and I went to update this slide for this presentation, and there are over a hundred companies in this space now. First of all, I'm not a very good graphic artist. Secondly, it was going to take a lot of time. And third, you wouldn't be able to read it anyway, right? But the growth in this market space is dramatic. And the applications are um, growing just, you know, as we heard from the earlier speaker, using ground penetrating radar to do crop detection. That one even kind of tilted my head um, how, you would, how you would do that. But the imagination is there. I, I'll never forget, I was, um, it was 2011, maybe 2012, and I got a call from a, a person I'd never met before, and he asked me to have lunch with him. He was in downtown DC, and I said, sure. So he introduced himself, we met at this nice restaurant, he introduced himself, and he said, you know, I, I'm with this new company, it's called Planet, Planet Labs. And we're going to cover every inch of the earth every day. And I just thought, this kid is crazy. Right? This is not going to happen. But, you know, who's the fool now? Right? I was. And Planet covers every inch, every day. And that wasn't so long ago. Right? So the pace of innovation is just amazing. But the speed of it is driven here by the private sector. Drones. So, and this one actually surprised me. Um, the development of drones, the first drone was developed in 1917. Um, it was developed by the British uh, Royal Air Force. The drone was used for target practice for, for whatever weapon they were using, I, I don't know. Bard didn't tell me that. Um, I know the, uh, the first drone developed for civilian mapping was in 2012. It was a sense Fly B. Um, I first saw my first drone in 2009. I was running that airborne mapping company, and I was at a private conference of commercial companies that do airborne mapping. And this young man came in with this prototype of a drone and said that he was going to sell these things to all of us, and we could get rid of all our aircraft and pilots. And, you know, in the next six or seven years, we'd be, we'd be primarily using drones. And I remember thinking, gosh, he might be right, but how am I going to get this $2.5 million camera that weighs 175 pounds on that drone, right? But the imagination of the instrument manufacturers took, took hold. And today, um, a lot of airborne mapping, whether it be LIDAR or uh, imagery, is done from drones, not to mention a, a thousand other applications, identifying sharks near beaches, a whole host of things. Um, again, LIDAR was f first funded by the government, was funded by the British government, um, but it has scaled, driven by the commercial sector. Now look at that market map. That was in 2016. I didn't even begin to contemplate updating that map. So, particularly to the students and the young professionals in the audience, um, things are changing so quickly, so fast. There's so much opportunity. Um, I think that should be the takeaway. You can't know everything, and due, due to AI and ML, you won't have to know everything in the future. Um, but uh, it's a great field to be in. This, however, is my favorite drone. These are called sail drones. Can I see uh, hands of people in the audience who've ever seen one before? Okay, there are a few. So I had the good fortune of being um, on sail drones board of advisors when they first started and subsequently a consultant to them for a number of years. Um, this company is the vision of a man by the name of Richard Jenkins and Richard was really fascinated with land speed records for wind-powered vehicles back in the early 2008, 2009. And he worked for nine years to develop a vehicle that held the world's land speed record 
for over a decade, 126 miles an hour, powered entirely by wind in the Mojave Desert. And after he achieved that, he spent the next two or three years designing this. He took the vehicle that went in the Mojave Desert and created a drone that can sail the oceans. That drone can stay out in the ocean for a year at a time. Those drones have circumnavigated the Antarctic and they go right up to the sea ice in the Arctic. They um, are, there are actually three drones now. Uh, this is the smallest one. Um, it's called the Explorer, it's 23 feet. The next one is 32 feet. It's called the Voyager. The Explorer primarily works on environmental missions. Those missions are uh, oceanography, marine, uh, marine biology. Um, uh, they track whales at sea. Uh, they, every drone is outfitted with a suite of cameras on board, and since the very first mission, Every image has been through labeling, and I'm sure SailDrone has the largest training data library of ships at sea, as well as birds at sea, as well as the occasional seal that will crawl up and try to catch a free ride on one of them. The 32-foot Voyager um, is primarily maritime domain awareness. Uh, there are many of them in the Persian Gulf as we speak, um, and I believe the Coast Guard just announced uh, the deployment of many um, in the Gulf and in the Southern Pacific. The largest one is the Surveyor. The Surveyor is 72 feet and does bathymetric mapping up to 6,000 meters. The ocean is a very hostile environment. And if you can keep people out of harm's way, and you can run these on wind and solar power primarily, the larger one does have a diesel engine on board, um, and keep them out to sea and work 24-7, it's a much more efficient platform. I, um, I know this is a bit of an eye chart, but these are just the instruments and the instrument locations that you can see. They, measure uh, oceanographic variables, um, wind strength, direction, air temperature, pressure, humidity, solar radiation, uh, salinity, dissolved oxygen, um, dissolved carbon, um, underwa underwater sounds, a whole host of different technologies. So I suggest you keep your eye on that company and that technology. They also, a year and a half ago or a year ago, put one right in the middle of a category four hurricane um, this hurricane season, they have, I believe, 10 deployed in the Southeast Atlantic and in the Gulf of Mexico. And it brings back research and data on hurricanes, which we've never had the opportunity uh, to study before. So this brings me to the Radiant Earth Foundation. And, um, you, know, it's, you know, when I started in college, I was actually using car uh, punch cards. Not many other people in this room can say that, I'm sure or would want to admit it, uh, but uh, over the last 43 years to see what's happened, to see LIDAR evolve, to see the plethora of satellites on orbit evolve, um, to see compute power increase, to see, and, and really what put us over at the edge, I think, was cloud computing. Um, it was an opportunity to kind of me to recast and think what a new opportunity would be and also to see the great disparity in this world between those who have and those who have not. Um, and it was pretty much the alignment of these technologies that um, inspired me to create uh, the Radiant Earth Foundation. And our vision <clears throat> has been to combine machine learning and Earth observations for a positive global impact, primarily with a focus on the global south and empowering those organizations um, and, and individuals with training data and the tools necessary uh, to apply this technology to the uh, sustainable de development goals globally. Really what we do, <clears throat> we were lucky enough to get funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, from the Pierre Omidyar Network, from the Schmidt Foundation, Schmidt Family Fund, 
and a host of other organizations, NASA and others, to begin building open training data libraries. So we've all, we've heard it several times today. What's the, what's the big, one of the big problems? Quality, trustworthy training data. And so we built ML Hub with support from NASA to host that and make it open to anyone in the world. Uh, we held a number of education projects around the globe to teach people how to collect quality training data. We've held projects to teach people how to develop these algorithms, work with universities around the world uh, with a primary focus on the global south. And we've, we've seen some real advancements. Um, I'm going to quickly run through two, and this certainly isn't the sexiest one you're ever going to see, but from a sustainable development fashion, um, it, it's important. This is monitoring sludge volume in sanitation, sanitation facilities in D Dakar. Um, the private sector runs most of these sanitation facilities. The philanthropies pay for them to run it, and you never really know what you're paying for unless you have someone there on site 24-7. So the Gates Foundation asked us to take a look at developing an application where we could monitor sanitation facilities using satellite imagery. In this case, we used Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, to monitor this facility. We did get some positive results. Uh, we would be better served by uh, a deeper bench of training data a slightly higher resolution, um, and not such a cloudy location. This actually, and I, I debated whether to show you this or the one uh, that you heard about earlier when the gentleman from Oak Ridge uh, presented on a panel earlier today. Um, Oak Ridge National Labs <coughs> worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to develop many of those methodologies. Um, for the GRID project, which was the first using satellite imagery to identify building structures. And then Oak Ridge went and took and refined that to be able to identify every structure in the US. But the reason the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is so interested in identifying every structure in sub-Saharan Africa is because they're very interested in polio, right, and malaria and they need to know where the people are. There are no reliable census in many of those countries. They need to estimate how many people live in that building by how big it is. They correlate with cell phone records that move in and out of that building. Um, and then they have to identify what route they're going to take to get the medicines in. And then they have to figure out how they're going to keep a cold chain because much of that vaccine must stay cold the entire time. So they were willing to spend the money in this project with, is with Maxar data, um, and uh, they were willing to spend the money to map the buildings of Africa. So machine learning challenges in the global development community are huge. If you think they're huge here, they're huge. Um, there's a lack of geodiversity. There's scarce data sources. There are data accessibility issues. There are interoperability issues. Data is not machine learning ready. And as a result, you get many biased and incorrect results. And the inability to capture a wide range of possible outcomes in space and time. You see those thumbnails. Um, those are agricultural crapping, cropping patterns, that's a hard thing to say, um, in different countries. Wheat grown in the U.S. looks very different than wheat grown in Tanzania or maize. Um, and computer vision needs to be trained on the maize in Tanzania if you're going to apply it in that part of the world. So they, they are big issues, but there are tremendous strides being made. Um, ad additionally, um, the issue of connectivity in the Global South, uh, the issue of collaboration and data sharing from an institutional as well as a technical perspective, capacity development, obviously, funding. Uh, but new problems have also emerged. 
and that's the privacy and surveillance issues in geolocation and machine learning, uh, bias and discrimination, misinformation and disinformation, particularly in the global south, uh, and the understanding and ability to stay abreast of this very rapidly changing market. So with that, oh, I would encourage you to uh, take a look. These are two of the latest initiatives from the Radiant Earth Foundation, the Source Cooperative and the Cloud Native Geospatial Foundation. They're both very interesting. Um, so I want to draw to a close because I see I have just a little bit of time here. Um, in conclusion, I think particularly for the young students in the room, um, there's never been a more exciting time or more innovative time, and I've been saying that for at least 15 years. Um, it is uh, a global market now. It didn't used to be uh, at all, uh, and markets across the globe are responding. The profession is rapidly diversifying. The first conference I went to, I was in graduate school, it was the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing Conference in 1984 in Washington, D.C. There were about 1,000 people there. There were three women. Um, and I believe all of us were Caucasian, right? So it's rapidly diversifying. There are serious issues related to ML and AI. Um, I want to finish with two maybe controversial topics quickly. That way you can't ask me about them. Um, commercial companies are driving that innovation once the initial investment has been created by the Department of Defense to create the technology. And as it relates to open data and open science, I believe the European Union is clearly leading the way. Um, and that comes back to it's a global market. And we're seeing the European Union, through their Copernicus program, really invest heavily in small startups as well as big companies to drive new and innovative products. So thank you. So it's my privilege to introduce the moderator of our next panel. Ms. Loesch Bush is the executive director of 39 North, an agri-food tech and plant science hub based in St. Louis. She is passionate about creating and sustaining programs that improve the human condition, and she works to build and sustain a thriving economy and culture that benefits all St. Louisans before joining 39 North, she was executive director at Arch Grants, working to attract and retrain extraordinary entrepreneurs to help build the future economy in St. Louis. Let's welcome Ms. Lois. Thank you so much. Y'all go up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, I'd love to invite all of the panelists to join us here. So as was just mentioned, I'm Emily Lozebush. I am the executive director of 39 North. And what we do at 39 North is we create places and spaces for innovators and ag tech startups and ag tech scale ups and plant scientists to come together and communicate and collaborate to feed, fuel, and build the future sustainably. So what about that mission brings me to be sitting here today moderating this panel? It's because for any of that to happen, you need innovation in GeoAI and digital ag. And so we have an incredible group of experts in those fields to talk a little bit about what they're doing and what is the latest and greatest in, in this sector now and as it relates to geospatial technology. So I will uh, start us off by asking each of these panelists to introduce themselves say a little bit about their role, and then I'd ask each of you to just give a quick overview of what perspective you're bringing to this discussion today. So I will start with you, Dave. Okay, good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Dave Burchett. I'm with NGA. I'm the National Geoint Officer for Economic Security, Threat Finance, or Counterfinancial Issues, and Climate Security. And what I bring to, to this is I'm NGA's representative to uh, Interagency Climate Advisory Security Council. That's a, a group that's run through the National Intelligence Council. It includes members of 
uh, Department of Defense, uh, Intelligence, the federal civil science community, as well as members from academia. We've actually got a, a member from uh, SLU staff, Dr. Jason Knauf, is also a member of the, uh, of the CSAC. And over the past two years, working with the interagency as well as across NGA, I've, uh, I've led the creation and stand-up of our, our climate security cell, uh, which is comprised of uh, eight members from multiple disciplines across multiple parts of our agency. We bring skill sets such as geoanalysis, analysis, uh, hybrid geo and analysis, which is basically a geo and analyst with uh, activity-based intelligence uh, background and skills. We have a human geographer, uh, a geospatial data scientist, remote image spectral scientist, uh, as well as uh, some other folks in source and research. So that's uh, what brings me here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Aaron. Great. Aaron Bittner, I'm uh, the president of Bungie Food Solutions Business. Uh, Bungie, if you don't know, is a, a global, uh, leading global agribusiness firm. Uh, we're, you know, we're charged with connecting farmers to consumers and consumers across food, fuel, feed, uh, you know, really across the world. Uh, the perspective I'm, I'm here to bring is really how this uh, technology connects practically to uh, consumers and customers and how we see that you know changing the way that we're able to deliver um, uh, solutions to customers and ultimately to uh, to consumers and the brands that we all know and, and love wonderful thank you so much Leanna hello Leanna Guerin and I understand we're probably the last panel between this and the networking so we'll try and make this really exciting I am the director of data for digital farming solutions at Bear crop science uh, located here in st. Louis Bayer is arguably the company with access to the largest amount of agricultural research data in the world, all the way from our innovative, pipe, innovative pipeline in seeds and traits and crop protection, in addition to our climate field view uh, on-farm data that we have access to. Bringing solutions to farmers is going to be a significant challenge and we're going to require a lot of partnerships with geospatial AI, methodology as well as this amount of data if we want to help farmers optimize and maximize the amount of productivity on their farms. So my job is to not only bring insights to farmers, they have a lot of access to insights today, but how do we make recommendations and therefore help them make better and faster uh, decisions for their farms? Wonderful. Wasit. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wasit Sagan. Uh, as, uh, I'm a professor of geospatial science. Uh, Associate Vice President for Geospatial Science at St. Louis University and the Deputy Director of the Taylor Geospatial Institute. And you know, Taylor Geospatial Institute is a consortium of eight outstanding Midwest research institutions. And our vision is to be the nation's academic lead in geospatial science and accelerate St. Louis's development as global uh, capital of geospatial science. Um, what I'm excited today to talk about is uh, geospatial AI and why and, and why it's important for digital ag and how it can uh, play an important role in, in uh, uh, mitigating global climate change and, and uh, improving our sustainability. Okay. Nadia. Um, hi everybody, good afternoon. My name is Nadia Shakur and I am a principal investigator at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center. And my research program focuses primarily on how do we leverage ecotech, uh, you know, geospatial tech to really understand the environment and um, management practices that impact crop yield and crop um, sort of resilience to the environment. So we have a really good handle on the research side of the genetics. How can we leverage the genetics and use these technologies to better understand the environment is what we work on. So. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. As you can see, we have an incredibly uh, experienced and knowledgeable panel. I will start off by asking some questions, but just like has been the case the rest of the day, as you and the audience have questions, please feel free to send. I will be trying to remember to check my one of my many technical devices I have up here. Um, but to, to start us off, um, and, and I will, I guess, direct this to you, Vasit, because you kind of started talking about this in your introduction. Tell us just in a broad sense, what is GeoAI as it relates to uh, digital ag and food security, and, um, and why is it important? So great question, and, and there are so many terms today, right? AI, GeoAI, generative AI, and, and 
so on. Um, I think it's important to talk about then dual AI, uh, a subfield of AI, and which intersects um, AI and geospatial science, and why it's unique, why it's important, and 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 uh, it's about you know applying AI algorithms and technologies to geospatial big data, which is coming from satellites, drones. And, and mobile pings and, and social media and, and whatever the data sets that has spatial component. And, and, and those data sets, and as we know today, our major and actually largest source of data sets, and we have been collecting those data sets for decades and decades. Um, so, and, and GeoAI is about utilizing those data sets, analyzing patterns, extracting information for our informed decision making. And AI for decades have made uh, numerous uh, ad advancements, but, but Geo AI, in my view, is, is still the rising star, uh, the next big thing in technological developments, because the foundation of that is, is big data. That data is unique, and as we know, every week there is a satellite being launched to the sky. Thousands of satellites are circling around the globe day and night, collecting data sets. Those unique data sets which makes geo AI so powerful and that's why it's uh, it's very important and and I will talk about why it's important for AG but I will pause here maybe and if my colleagues have other suggestions on that yeah that's that's a really good kind of overview um, and um, I know for me understanding it in practice is always really helpful to, to understand something really big and broad like that so Aaron I'm wondering if um, you could maybe give some examples of how GeoAI is being applied at scale across agri-food systems even today. Yeah, uh, sure. I, and I think I represent more the sort of end of the chain, you know, closer to the consumer um, as, uh, as, you know, a rep for Bungie here. But the, uh, you know, I, when we use this, when we look at it, we think about it in two terms, sort of an offensively and defensively. Um, from an offensive perspective, you know, a big part of our business uh, and a big part of the you know agri chain revolves around the trading of ag commodities, and you know in the in the trading world for ag or really for any uh, uh, instruments, uh, you know knowing something that the rest of the world doesn't know is a is a fundamental uh, you know differentiator. It's how you make money. It's how you stay in uh, in uh, in business for uh, for 200 years, and as you know as as time has gone on, the democratization of data and and information has made it harder and harder for firms like Bungie to you know, uh, continue to make money as a, as a trader of, uh, of ag commodities. But what this brings is a really a new sources of, of insight and information that we can plug into a, a trading system that helps us understand supply and demand you know, better. And it's everything from being able to count the number of you know, bags of soybeans on a farm in Argentina to you know, being able to predict better what crop yields look like or how you know, commodities are moving around the world and what sort of quantities. All of that info is, is getting collected in, in many different ways now and assimilated into our trading models that help our traders make decisions about how to, how to position us uh, and, uh, and how to uh, ultimately generate you know, profitability. That's one aspect of it. Probably the, the, the bigger aspect and the, the one that's really growing more and more for us is, is more on the defensive side. And that's really about the, the kind of contract that we have with our end customers. So if you go to the grocery store and you look at the brands up and down the uh, aisles, you know, most of those are our customers. Uh, and they, they expect us to originate, to buy the ingredients that they're ultimately buying from us in, in the right way. It's, it's not okay to indiscriminately uh, source ingredients anymore or source commodities. You have to know where it came from, how it was grown, how the people who grow it were treated, um, and so on and so forth. And you know, we, we source from about 200 million hectares of, of, of growing area around the world. Verifying you know, whether that stuff is being done the right way uh, in a manual fashion is just virtually impossible, right? We just cannot hire enough people, have enough feet on the, on the ground to do that. And you know, geospatial AI gives us all sorts of tools to monitor for deforestation, uh, monitor for uh, uh, you know, other issues uh, you know, that, that are of interest to our customers. So it's you know, allowed us to provide some uh, verification and validation to you know, the, the claims that we are expected to make to, to our customers about you know, where their, uh, their ingredients are coming from and, and uh, whether they meet their standards. 
that's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, Nadia, I'll start with you and this kind of even pulling that thread even a bit further from a global sustainability goals perspective and, and uh, solving the, the huge issue of global food insecurity. Can you speak a little bit to the role of GeoAI and geospatial AI in, in that? Yeah, sure. So where I really, I guess, see the potential is, um, you know, the, the potential of like the predictive analytics that's coming online, taking in the large amounts of data that we're collecting from satellites, from infield sensors, uh, across the board, you know, what, what we're monitoring across the supply chain and really pulling it into these predictive models that go back to the farmer, go back to the research um, to try and at the end, you know, how, how do we use this to use less nutrients? How do we use it to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change? Can we, can we gather all of this big data um, and transform it into um, metrics for you know, all sorts of things, whether it's carbon capture or you know, just, th there's a lot that could be done. So. Can I add a point on Please? that? Please, yes, so, of course. Sustainability in agriculture to me is use less nitrogen input so we can preserve our environment, preserve our water, and at the same time, improve productivity, mm -hmm. create more yield, right? We have to feed, remember, 70%, sure. produce 70% more food by 2050, right? So how do we get there? And then crops have evolved for thousands of years, maybe eight, 10,000 of years. Like in, in many ways, it's a living or organism knows how to respond to environment, it's stress, less or more nitrogen and this, that, right? Um, and understanding the rules of life for plants. Um, and, and it's important because then we can understand, like predict their response to drought or less, more nitrogen and this, that. Um, and that requires big data, right? And that's where GeoAI uh, helps us to analyze massive data, not just at global scale imagery, but microorganism level, like genes, like analyzing those and identifying genes that control maybe crop responses to water or nitrogen stress or, or, or heat stress, right? And if we do that and we can teach crops using AI how to respond to those organisms, so, so in terms of extreme weather events, um, uh, they can adapt better, do better, still produce more food. Um, and today, uh, in practice, uh, this is my understanding, uh, we use 30% more nitrogen fertilizer on crops than it's uh, needed, right? And just reducing 10% of the fertilizer used in, in, in farming today, that has huge impact for reducing uh, methane, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and that's actually a major contributor of climate change, right? So, um, and, and we are able to do this with this, this big data and bring in modeling, right? Crop growth modeling, AI modeling, and this, that, and machines, robotics, AI, and sensing, and quantum sensing is another big area, right? Bringing all of those together, only then we are able to answer those questions in a better way. Apply fertilizers where it's needed, when it's needed, the right amount, right? Sure. So that's, I think, um, uh, plays an important role to achieve sustainability. Absolutely, and Leanna, I know that you and at um, at Bayer, Bayer Digital Solutions, you're working with farmers all the time to to do exactly some of these things that we've been talking about. Do you want to talk a little bit about the the role of GeoAI um, as you see it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it takes all of us as partners in this space to achieve these sustainability goals and food insecurity and all these. Um, perspective. So my perspective from Bayer, we have a foreground, you can read about our sustainability program there, but essentially the role of GeoAI is where we can enable the activation of that science for farmers to enroll in these carbon credit programs mm -hmm. so that they can then sell those credits to companies like Delta Airlines who are producing massive amounts of you know, fuel emissions and things, and then by through the farming and the sustainable practices can offset you know, uh, fueling things from, de from Delta. And where GeoAI comes into play is we can use remote sensing models and other types of models to enroll farmers through field eligibility. We can 
track the exact boundary of the arable amount of land on their farm, removing the house and the, the sheds and the rivers or the creeks through their farms. We can use GOA models to detect prior cover crop usage. Tillage practice, sustainable tillage practices, did they have other types of um, sustainable management practices? And GOAI is a really important player in developing these types of models to verify field eligibility. That's, and actually that re relates to a question that's just come in around balancing uh, combating food insecurity with mitigating harmful impacts on the natural environment, which I think what I'm hearing everybody here saying is that the more precise we can be as to where we put uh, our interventions and, and when and where, the, the more effective we can be. Um, anybody want, care to, to um, speak to that a bit? I, I would maybe uh, build on that and just the the world is quickly starting to price carbon into uh, into the things we uh, we buy. Sometimes by government policy, sometimes because of consumer demands. Um, and the I would say the world is still trying to figure out how best to measure and manage, you know, carbon, uh, you know, across these these long supply chains that were basically built to treat everything like it was the same. Um, this technology starts to give us the, some of the tools to, to quantify that in a much more kind of effective way, in a much quicker way. Um, and you know, I'm a big believer in uh, you know, the power of capitalism, right? When people get paid to do things, they, they tend to do that. Um, and you know, connecting the, the capability with now the increasingly the, the, you know, a price being put on carbon is going to start to create more and more change. We've already seen that. In, for instance, in the United States, on with the low carbon fuel standards and how that's made a massive change to um, some of the uh, the ag food chains, um, uh, you know, and I think that's we're going to see more and more of that around the world. Well, and sort of from a, a slightly different perspective, um, Dave, I know that that you hear more and more often the the words uh, or the concepts of national security and food security very intertwined. I'm curious. In your, in your intro, you mentioned climate security and NGA's program um, in that area. I'm curious as to what exactly that is and how you're leveraging partnerships, data, services to, to kind of build that out. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, to start with, I'll just talk about the, how this ties into national security. So any of you in the audience right now could look up uh, the most recent unclassified annual threat assessment. This is produced yearly by an Office of Director of National Intelligence, or DNI. And as Director Whitworth mentioned this morning, we've, we've kind of got two priorities, and it's laid out pretty clearly. Number one, strategic competition with China as the pacing threat. The second priority is one that's, that's come up more and more recently, and it's, it's emerging as a critical threat, and that's defined as transnational threats. For us in GA, we would call them somewhat non-traditional in the sense of we're not looking at basic order of battle of military forces, but these transnational threats include things like migration, climate change, food security, the Arctic as a region, as a, as a, as a transnational threat, uh, drugs, crime, and, and these, are, these are areas where not just food security itself, but the technology and those applications of geospatial AI is a critical, uh, it's a critical layer of our ability to answer those kinds of questions. Our remit is global, and we have no ability to, to address these without you know, what we call internally uh, analytic modernization. So using uh, AI, ML, computer vision, um, uh, uh, structured observation management, and trying to apply them to, to these emerging, uh, uh, emerging sets. Uh, to the second part of your question, how are we building our program and leveraging um, partnerships and commercial data? This is, this is basically the way that, that we're having to address it writ large, mainly because we know the expertise resides with, with, with you guys, with, uh, with academia, with, with private industry, and, and the bulk of the data that's relevant for these issues is also, is also uh, either um, open, academic, publicly available or, or a commercial. And I've got a couple examples I'll talk about. Um, the first of which is global fishing. Everyone's aware this is an environmental issue, it's an economic issue, um, and it's a priority for us, but not all priorities are created the same, and it's one that we've historically had, had trouble um, effectively staffing. We've worked with the interagency. We had a rep here, it's a SLU PhD, Sean Hartling, who's out here in the crowd, uh, partnered with Dr. Jason Knauft, also from SLU, 
Um, and we were partnered through a group called the National Security Innovation Network, or NSIN. They partnered NGA up with Carnegie Mellon University and working with a group of undergrads where those students were able to develop uh, basically a novel analysis and a way forward for us to address global phishing that not only addresses uh, congressionally directed actions or, or national level priority, but also uh, command priorities. And some of those included serving up commercial data through a service like Global Fishing Watch, and that's, that's helping both at, at uh, AFRICOM and, uh, uh, and, and US Southcom. We're also leaning pretty heavily in the commercial side for issues such as greenhouse gas detection, and one I would say in particular would be our efforts at uh, detecting methane. Uh, methane is a, it's a, it's a priority for the administration, just in general terms. It's the lowest hanging fruit in terms of reducing overall carbon in the atmosphere. It's got a long, uh, shorter shelf life than, uh, than carbon dioxide. Um, and our ability to use commercial data not only helps us answer those questions, but it's, it gives us the ability to support our policymakers mm. in, in the diplomatic sense with, with information that's easily uh, releasable and, uh, and able to downgrade from, uh, from other higher sources. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, anybody want to add to that? We can. Okay. So switching, you had you've talked a little bit about um, the commercial components of this. I'd actually, um, and I think Leanna, you might be a, a good place to start. But please, everybody, feel free to to jump in here. I'm curious as to what trends and stakeholder needs um, you think are driving. GeoAI or uh, digital ag, and um, how are you seeing those evolve over time? Yeah, it's a great question. Digital farming is not a static term or concept. It is evolving, and in my opinion, it's not evolving rapidly enough. We need to feed two billion more people in the next 30 years. We need to evolve a lot faster to solve before our food demands become a food crisis. So to that perspective, today, most equipment manufacturers, regardless of the color of their equipment, and most seed and crop production producers have some digital solutions out there, whether it's connected cab data through their cabs, on equipment sensors. So farmers have it up or um, anything in a phone on their app for field health imagery, for example. We talk to farmers every single day around the world, whether it's smallholder farmers in Asia, soybean farmers in Brazil, or corn farmer in central Illinois, they have more than an abundant amount of access to data insight tools. And they agree that those are nice to have, but they want tools to help them make decisions. How do they turn that data into helping them make decisions to have higher productivity on their operation? Because they're running their operation. I mean, it's their business. And so they need to manage their, out, their inputs to have more outputs. So how do we take all this data and help turn that from insights into recommendations and solutions for their operation? And GeoAI is going to be a big component of that. And I think on the other end of the chain, I don't think there's a major food company in the world that doesn't have science-based target commitments, you know, commitments around reducing carbon through their chain. And the, there's so much you can do around with the supply chain and your own production facilities Ultimately, it's got to go back to the farm, and the farmer is where you know the, the real big impact can happen. Um, you know, and again, this technology is helping measure that um, the data that uh, that Leanne's talking about are, is is a huge part of um, I'll say quantifying uh, that and and putting values to that with uh, with customers. I I would venture to say at least three quarters of the discussions that we have with customers today are about some form of decarbonization of their supply chain. You know, it's not how do I make my products, you know, tastier or cheaper or healthier. It's, you know, how do I get carbon because I have a commitment by 2025 or 2028 to reduce carbon by a certain amount and the world's still trying to figure that out. But uh, again, this is uh, technology is a big part of enabling that. Mm -hmm. Nadia is both a, a PI at the Danforth Center here in St. Louis and a, uh, a founder of a, of a startup yourself. I'm curious what trends you're seeing and how you see those evolving over time. Yeah, um, that's, that's interesting. So like from a research perspective, you know, we've always been told the farmer's very interested in yield and that's it. That's what it all comes down to is yield, yield, yield. Um, however, what I, what I think is on the horizon is where our research is focused on is not just yield, but in um, 
yield in the current climate. Resilience is actually what we'll be breeding for. We're not going to be necessarily be breeding for yield. We'll be breeding for yield in a changing climate. Um, and that also brings into kind of what's happening around the world um, and regions where may or may not be as agriculturally productive due to wars or whatever you may have. So being able to sort of pivot um, based off of, and, and not just go after just yield, but taking into context a lot of the environmental data that we'll be capturing through GEO AI. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Dave Bassett, any, any feedback on trends or, or evolving trends that you're seeing? whether from the research or the consumer side? Yeah, so uh, applied to digital agriculture, the trends I see is that beyond yield, right, what other traits from crops we can expect? And of course, the market is driven by how much more yield I can produce, right? But there are whole other things like fiber, uh, energy, and, and nutri uh, the, the nutrient content, seed composition, right, and, and those things, right? So uh, often it's, it's invisible, but that's where the research going. We are using satellite imagery, geo AI, uh, novel sensing technologies to predict uh, uh, fiber uh, and, and, and those uh, seed composition uh, uh, components from uh, satellite imagery and just that from in-season crops that, that, that allows us, uh, our, our farmers, uh, to kind of maintain a competitive advantage and, and in the international market, um, and that's one. And then second is really in terms of data and analytics piece, um, combining AI big data crop growth models that, that actually is based on the physics of how crops respond to the light and grow conditions, right? And combining all of those uh, and, and to improve, uh, uh, predict, uh, potential issues in in uh, in early stage and predicting you know yield or this that um, and that's the kind of trend I see in in digital ag. Excellent. I just uh, maybe not to repeat myself, but the, you know people care about where their food comes from now more than ever, and and I think you know it's it's not just generational, but certainly uh, uh, you know the the younger generations you know, have voiced a much stronger, uh, you know, concern and, and, and care for this. And that's what, you know, I see food companies responding to as well. It hasn't yet translated uh, to, in a big way, people willing, willing to pay for it um, or pay more for their products, but that will absolutely come, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, the, the, the technology of in being able to, you know, understand that this came from an area that wasn't deforested where, you know, they have the right kind of human rights policies uh, and uh, we know exactly who the, the, the grower, the farmer was of this commodity. And doing that in a system that is built to treat everything exactly the same um, is, uh, is not an easy task. But uh, you know, to, to Anna's point, it takes kind of all the partners in the chain uh, working together to make that happen. And, and it's really starting to happen now. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that I think that there is a, an, a growing uh, call for that across the value chain. And, um, and it's an exciting opportunity, right, as we think about marrying these, um, these what sometimes seem like competing issues with feeding more people and, and uh, respecting and um, regenerating what the, the earth produces. So um, maybe to actually build on that a little bit, and this is a, this is a pretty big, meaty question, but from all of your perspectives, how do you think we can amplify the, the impact of GeoAI and of digital ag to really improve the quality of life for people on this planet, for our planet? Um, what do you think is kind of the big, here's how we move all of these things we've been talking about into a, a big move for, for humanity? And I'll, anyone who wants to start is welcome to, to take that one. Maybe I'll, I'll start. I think democratization of this uh, research and data is going to be key to that speed to market and focusing on the con customer, whether the customer's farmer, downstream supply chain partners. Um, it's going to take moving our research faster from academia into the hands of commercial partners that can turn that into digital product solutions. 
and we need to remove the amount of bureaucracy associated with that, and also the fear of imperfect science. I'm a statistician, so imperfect science really used to scare me a lot until I realized there, you know, the old saying, there's no such thing as a perfect model or whatever, and that really is true. And so in the real world, to achieve these really significant and important goals, we need to really think about how do we scale faster and really what's good enough to solve these problems. I'd say, going off of what, what Leanna said, I like what you said about speeding that process up, especially to the, to the delivery side, because that's where government comes in. You know, we're, we're relying on you, especially in this sector, to, to deliver those solutions because you have the expertise and, and the data and the know-how. You know, for us, it's once we can bring that in, we can apply it broadly, you know, just from some of the examples we've seen today, some of the, the stuff yesterday over at TGI, especially in like the spectral field, you know, categorizing types out, how that impacts like, you know, predictive food security, not current. How do we get ahead of that? How can we see, is there gonna be an issue for food or water security? That's historically an indicator of regional unrest. You know, what about countries that don't make their data available and to like the World Food Program, for example, China, big example, they don't publish their data. How can we somehow, you know, verify that through publicly available data that, that you guys are going to hopefully create and deliver to us? So in academia, we strive for creating new knowledge, new discoveries, training next generation students, talent to address you know, tomorrow's problems, right? And we do great uh, uh, groundbreaking research and often uh, we publish and, and work hard actually to publish those work in top uh, peer reviewed journals. And, and we are proud of that, right? So that's great, um, you know, and, and the, then very few of us, I myself as an academic, I pay less attention to who is reading those papers, right? I know that it rarely gets to a farmer's hand. I mean, if I am a farmer, why should I care a paper or this, that? I just need my cell phone to get the information. If I can, that's the best thing, right? So those papers live in that world of uh, uh, the, the journals and, you know, it's even, to access that you have to pay. Um, so uh, to amplify the impact of GOAI in ag in general, so what, what needs to be done, I think, is that um, bring those innovations to, um, to market and someone focus on that and helping with commercializ commercialization and, and this, that, and turning, transforming those into products and companies. That's where actually we see the biggest impact, right? That's one and second uh, area is actually we have to really, everyone in this room has to really work hard is to trust each other. And whenever we want to work with a company, industry, and, and what comes with IP, who owns IP? And then uh, the fear of, oh, something results from this great research, and a thousand la years later, maybe it turns into a great product that creates uh, trillions of dollars of revenue, and fear of losing that revenue, we may see or we may not see in uh, decades down the road, you know, that's another um, area we have to work on to amplify the impact of GAI and ag and in general to improve quality of mm -hmm. life for everyone. Yeah, um, well, build, building on Vasit's point, um, some of the most exciting kind of conversations I've had in this, in this field has always been when it's been a collaborative group. Um, it's always when you have that agronomist, the data scientist, you know, the plant scientist, and just kind of talking about, you know, what does it mean for a farmer? You know, having all of those folks in the room, I think that's where um, it, it, all the magic happens. And keeping the end user experience in mind, like, like you mentioned, you know, what, what is that product or what is the output of all of our work? You know, how does it translate to the farmer? I think is, is super critical. And, uh, um, and then from the company and having a startup in this world where we're trying to take all of this data and make meaningful, you know, advancements in agriculture, um, realizing that innovation in this space and how we're working right now, it's, it's an iterative process um, and it is ongoing and taking in feedback, learning from each other, I think is, and, and continuing, persevering as well, I think is going to be very critical in this field. Mm -hmm. 
lots to add. I want to actually follow up quickly on what you were just saying, Nadia, and say um, I'm curious that iterative innovative process, there's a, there's a number of students that we know that are they're sitting here today listening to this and thinking about what their next career may be or what their career may be in geospatial and ag and hopefully maybe the nexus of the two. Um, what advice would you give um, to, to a student or a person that's thinking about coming into this sector as to what they should be thinking about and, and maybe how to make that happen? Yeah, uh, well, two of the things I think really embrace that collaboration. Um, they're th some of the biggest exciting research you will not be the expert in. Um, you, you have to pull in experts from different fields to, particularly if you're interested in applied and, and you want to make that difference. You have, you can't be the only person doing it. You have to have a whole team of people all giving in their expertise. So finding a good group of people that you can work with on your ideas and um, yeah, and then also the, the fact that it's it's iterative. You got to keep keep at it and persevere through it. Um, if you have a good idea, um, you know, keep getting that feedback and keep refining um, your your goals. That's, that's wonderful. Anybody have anything to add? I mean, I think what's really unique about this, this panel is we're talking to five experts on a global scale, but the Danforth Plant Science Center, Taylor Geospatial Institute, Bayer, Bungie, NGA, all have an incredibly significant presence here in St. Louis. So uh, anybody else, any advice that you would give to a student or somebody who's, who's looking to engage in this in St. Louis? Yeah, I, would, I don't think there's ever been a more interesting time, certainly not in the span of my career, to be in food and ag. Um, you know, we're in the midst of just a, a massive transformation. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a huge part of it. And, you know, as, as far as St. Louis is concerned, I mean, you can draw a circle around St. Louis, and I, I've heard different numbers in terms of the percentage of the, of the, you know, the country's food uh, uh, supply, how much of that comes from uh, that, but it's, a, it's, you know, a huge percentage. This is becoming a, a very interesting, you know, environment for ag food. Uh, we've we've got everything from startups to, you know, uh, big established players like Bungie, um, and uh, and everything in between. And uh, I, uh, I and I personally feel like it's a, a incredibly noble, you know, profession. It, you know, food doesn't go out of style. Um, you know, iPhones might, but uh, people don't stop eating. And uh, but the way they're going to eat and their expectations of what they eat are changing massively, and that's what I think makes it such an exciting uh, space. Absolutely, Dave. I, I'd say, so I, I did the bulk of my career in the DC area, and then a little bit overseas, and I've been in St. Louis for just over three years now, and from what I've seen so far, it's a really unique like, setup here, the, the, the government, private, academic mm -hmm. uh, interaction. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't this way, to my experience, working uh, in a national capital region, and I think it's, uh, it's a really, it's a really good thing to take advantage of. And these kinds of issues, these, as I mentioned, uh, transnational issues, food, water, climate, migration, they're really great ways to partner with NGA. And we're always looking for ways to, uh, to, to, to engage, to bring in additional content capability and, and, and operationalize what, what you guys can, can all provide for us. All right, and I have these giant counting down numbers are telling me we only have 40 seconds left, but we started a few minutes late, so I am going to take the liberty of giving us just maybe one more minute to just quickly go down the line. I always think that in this type of panel discussion, there's something that, at least when I'm on that side of it, I always wish I would have gotten a chance to say and didn't, is that what do you want to leave this group with uh, as, as we close out this panel and this, this incredible day that everybody's experienced? And whoever looks at me like they know what they want to right. say, I'll start with. Go ahead, Leanna. I'll go ahead. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and start. Know your why. What are you passionate about? But be able to articulate why you're passionate about that. You have your technical skills, and that's great. But what problems are you trying to solve, and why are they important to you? And be able to communicate that to your peers, your stakeholders, your potential employers. Vasek? Well, uh, whatever you do, do it with passion. As my student in the previous session, Kyer, talked about, uh, and, and be, up, be persistent, right? And then whatever the technology, GeoAI, AI, computer science, whatever you learn, uh, geospatial science, it has to solve a problem. You have to have a mission. And, and digital ag, it's about 
AI, robotics, or can be something totally different, right? At the end, uh, whatever we do, whether it's a food security issue, national security issue, or preserving the environment, we have to have a mission, passion, and be persistent. I love that. Nadia? Um, well, I actually don't know how many folks in the audience are ag or have known about ag or the potential um, use of AI in ag. And I would just want to say, please think about it. Uh, we could really use really smart people. The application of these technologies is just mind boggling. I learn about it every day. And, um, um, and, and your sort of expertise and knowledge applying it towards such a critical, important problem that we're all facing, our food security, climate change, all of that good stuff. So um, as you guys are working on your own programs, maybe kind of think about ag and plant science. <laughs> food and ag is a sexy business, and uh, I think uh, you'll be the life of the party uh, if you uh, <laughs> find food. As you said, everyone eats. Yes. <laughs> I'll just say uh, this is an exciting, um, it's an exciting career field. Uh, Geo went for with these types of missions, and you know we've talked a lot today about STEM, but there's a lot of room to be creative and deliver solutions that haven't been delivered before. Um, so you know, take advantage, take chances, and, and take risks. Wonderful. Well, I, I can't think of a, a better message to leave on than that. So thank you all so much. Thank you to SLU for for hosting us, and um, and please, we'll all be available if you have questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you.